Okay, so for anybody that's wondering what we're talking about, uh, we're talking about like like the the amount of time I did a lot of drugs and how I got away from it. Like I like to involve my audience with this stuff, man. I have a lot of people that I talk to on Instagram. The, the pharmaceutical companies are just, I mean, it's a whole thing. We all know how evil that shit is, right? So I was taking on average about 16, like narcos or lower tabs, whatever, whatever, a day. If I could get some methadone, if I can get some iron, I'll take that. If I can get some, I'll do that. If I get some powder, I'll do that. I was just a opiate. That's what I was. I mean, it was like, it wasn't even like an addiction. It was my entire life. Like, that's all I did. I woke up every day, went out to the hood on the bus, did some work, got some bread, hit the dude. And then sometimes I would get real lucky and be able to move some product and get free stuff. What, and what's, that, a, what, what's all that mean for some of us that don't know the lingo? Like, hit the bus? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? I would literally get on a metro bus and drive from, like, one shitty part of town to, like, the worst hood in Houston and go as a white guy walking around this fucking neighborhood that I had no business being in. Right. I lived yeah. I lived in the neighborhood for a while, too. So, like, I knew people. That's how I met everybody. I lived there for a while. Sure. Section 8 housing in 3rd Ward, Houston, was not that difficult to get into. Uh, it, you just had to have very little money and proof of so. And so, you know, I, I, I lived out there for a long time. I shared a place with a couple of people at one point um, on the outskirts of that neighborhood. And so, like, I just got to know people from being a kind of guy that was down for whatever. And so I would ride a bus an hour one way, go into the area where I would go, and then I would hit some licks, go take care of some business, go move some stuff for some people, go collect some money for somebody that was owed money, whatever it was, man. Yeah. And then I would get – and sometimes I'd have to go out there twice a day, and sometimes it was a two-and-a-half-hour bus ride one way because I'd be across town. And so all like to my whole, high. <laughs> no, no, all to not get sick. Yeah, not get sick. Bro, yeah. I almost never got – the last five years of that, I wasn't getting high. I was – I was staying stable. People go, I got to get well. That's what that was. I was getting well. I was on, I was getting my meds, bro. It wasn't even, it was yeah. literally a medication at that point. And like, so I would go out there and and they went from when I started taking them, they were like two bucks a piece. So it wasn't even a big deal. Right. You got there with a $20 bill. You're good, bro. 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. You're good. But at the end of it, man, they were like six and $7 a piece. And that was like homeboy price. Like right now they're probably $15 a piece. Like this what? is stuff that rich people take. And now you got to worry that, you know, you'll die because it's pressed with no, you know, dude, like you couldn't pay me to do drugs no. right now. I'm okay. So, so for anybody's wondering, I'm 10 years, I'm almost, I'm almost I'm 10 and a half years clean. I've drank a couple of times and I've taken a couple of like hallucinogens to kind of open my mind mm. up a little bit. So I haven't been like stone cold sober the whole time, but I don't do any drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol and I'm a bartender. I still don't drink. I just don't care. I don't want to yeah. drink. I don't want to, I got a family now. So that's how I got clean. I was literally high on the day my kid was born. I was in the hospital off a lot of things, bro. Like I was out of there. I probably took 20 or so that day. And I and we had him in the morning. So I was like, I was lifted, bro. And, well, and I was your anxiety. Just, I bet your anxiety was just peaking too. So it was like dude, it was it was at a level I can't even explain. Like I was yeah. so scared that I just kept taking drugs because I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do right now. I got a kid right. coming and I never planned on living this long. Yeah. And so, um, you know, in the hospital and then all of a sudden, dude, like I've told this story a couple of times. People like it, though. It's a good story, man. I'm holding my kid. He's here right now somewhere, man. I'm holding my oldest kid. I have three kids now and I'm holding him and he's looking at me. And he's got these big ass blue eyes, man. And he's just staring at me. And I, I mean, he's like four minutes old, dude. Yeah. And I started crying and it was like sure. a mixed bag of emotions, bro. I was like scared. I was happy. I was excited. Uh, and then I also felt like this big because I also knew I was fucked up, you know. And so I told my wife, I was like, I don't think I can do this. And she's like, do what? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm like, it's I'm happening. like, no, no, no. Like, like I was thinking something completely different. I was talking about like, I need to get my life together is what I was telling her. But yeah. I'm a junkie. So I'm talking to her like an idiot. And uh, but I cry. A tear hit my little guy in the face. Boop on his forehead. Just blink. And he kind of goes. Like that, and he like looks at me, kind of like almost crying. And I, but I started laughing. I was like, "Oh man, this is crazy." I was like, "I don't know what to do right now." I have a photograph from about five minutes after that happened. That some lady walked in with a camera. I was like, hey, "Want to take a photo?" And I, we were like, "Sure." And she took some pictures of us because it was our first kid. And they like printed them, and it was like I don't know, twenty bucks or something. They gave us these big, nice, glossy photos. But we got them framed up in our room. But that photo is minutes after that happened. I was. Yeah. In that photo, I'm out of there, bro. Like I'm I'm on cloud nine for a number of reasons, but my adrenaline was pumping. Like, but so I just 
we didn't have money for like rehab. We didn't have money for help or anything. So I just started like Googling, like, what do you do when you're dealing with this? Because he was born on May 6th and I didn't get cleaned up till about middle of July. It took me like two months to figure, like figure out I needed some help. And so I kept going to these clinics and they were like, hey, we can help you out. But you have to come in 72 hours like sober. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, look, you know what a junkie is. So right. You no, know, 72 hours. You may as well be, be telling me six months. Yeah. You're gonna be covered in piss and shit and sweat. And, you know. Bro, yeah, <laughs> dude. Like real talk, bro. Like you mm -hmm. might be shitting yourself at that point. 72 hours, you might be covered in doo-doo, bro. Like right. And so I was just like hopeless. And I was like, man, I finally found a doctor that was like, Look, if you'll just come in and talk to me. We'll figure this out. And so I went in and talked to him and it was more or less like a, he's going to like ease me off of that onto something else. And then we're going to taper off this, but I have to follow a plan. I have to take drug tests. I have to do blood tests. I had to do like, you know, every 90 days I had to go in there and get all my heart, my lungs, my weight and everything checked just to keep up. I was healthy. Right. And so I've been with that same doctor for 10 years. Nice. And I still go in there and see him. I still use him as my MD now. And like I, I go into, I'm not a you know, general practitioner, whatever that's, you know, I go with my regular doctor. I use him as my regular doctor and I've never failed, but one drug test. And I told him I was going to fail it before I took it. Uh, <laughs> and that was like, that was like six months in, I ran out of my medication that they were giving me and they wouldn't refill it at Walgreens. And so I, I freaked out and went and got dope from the, from the dude down the road. And yeah. like, you know, in hindsight, that was a stupid move. I should have just called my doctor next morning. But the next morning would have been, I'd have been in the middle of, you know, uh, DTs. And I just wasn't built for that, bro. I'm just well, not, it, I wasn't willing good, to go through that again. It's a good thing that you didn't, you know, just take that opportunity as an excuse to just completely relapse, you know, which is what, what happens a lot of the time. Right. Well, I called my doctor immediately and told him like, hey, man, this is what happened. I need some help, dude. And he's like, oh, shit. Like, he was audibly like, like on the phone, like. <laughs> All right, get up here, man. You gotta, we gotta talk, man. You can't do this. And I'm like, and I, well, I, I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. And, he, and he's like, he's like, it's not because I give a crap. He's like, I can't give you this medication if you're doing that. So says the government. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, what? And so really, what the government wants, they want you hooked on something, bro. Mm -hmm. They want you on something, but they want to know what that something is. So it's it's all money and government and control. That's all it is. That's all it is. Well, it's just like anything else. And unfortunately, I'm sure there's tons and tons and tons of good rehab clinics, but I know. Oh, yeah, but there's tons of bad ones, I, too. Yeah, I personally know, you know, of a couple here. Our city has some bad issues with meth and and uh, yeah, there's some rehab centers where it's it's basically just a, a money making scheme. Just like right. anything else, you know, and where, where are you based out of again? Uh, Kokomo, Indiana. So it's a, okay. it's a small little town. Uh, 45 minutes, uh, south of, or north of Indianapolis. Okay. Um, any of these small towns in Indiana that you go to, um, are generally, they used to have factories. They used to have money and jobs coming in. Those factories are, a lot of them are gone. We're lucky in Kokomo that we still have Chrysler, but a lot of those factories have shut down. But people were already locked into, you know, 30 year mortgages. Right. So it turns into a place where where people are really impoverished and they have a lot of time on their hands. And then, you know, yeah. what happens with, with well, that, that? I mean, that sounds like small town Texas, just like anything else. It sounds like Florida. It sounds like Texas. It may, not, it may be different things. Like we didn't have factories necessarily. But yeah. We had jobs. We had jobs. We had communities and, and like a lot of small towns. I mean. Yeah, dude, it's, it's it all boils down to money and greed. I think at the end of the day is what it and because if you have that, you can get, you can get control. You can be yeah. government. If you have money, you can become government. It's not a problem. That's what government is. It's a big giant job. It's a big money making. It didn't used to be, but it is now. It's now. It's like I mean, well, I feel like it didn't used to be that. It used to be you know when, when at least when the country started. Anyways, there were some yeah. hopes and dreams, and you know uh, it's I it's shifted a lot. I, I don't know. I don't have a lot of knowledge on the subject, so I should <laughs> shut up about it. But <laughs> At least to me, it seemed like it used to be hopes and dreams built on a, we had a foundation and wasn't all good either. That was a lot of bad there as well. But yeah. it seems like now it just seems so gross now. Well, so like, I so, don't know. I guess it was pretty gross back then. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, shit, dude. I mean, so fucking slavery. I, so I'm pretty much politically like agnostic at this point. But I, I did see something the other day that reinforced a, a belief I have. Um, said the vice president 
when she came into office, uh, Kamala Harris, when she came into office, her net worth was $2 million, And now her net worth is $13 million. And her, her salary... Her salary is two hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars a year, so somehow she netted ten million dollars uh, just in the past four years. So it's it doesn't take a genius to see that, like, no matter what side of the coin you're on, right? Uh, there's some fuckery going on, you know. Well, look at the Clintons, <laughs> man. Hillary Clinton oh, yeah. was making like what half a million dollars to go talk at a school for an hour. Yeah, like, uh, way more than that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, like, so, I don't doubt that Kamala Harris has done the same thing. And like, I, I politically agnostic is a great way to put it. Like, I don't care about either side. I have my opinions, and I try to do what I can do. Yeah. To put my voice out there, and honestly, I feel kind of hopeless most of the time about it. So I kind of am one of those guys. It's like, man, I ain't even trying to mess with a bro. I got a family. I'm gonna worry about me. Like, right. I know that's, I know that's a, a cop out to some degree. No, but, that's that's it may be an age thing. Me and you are, are close in age. I'm 39. Uh, yeah. Happy birthday, by the way. I know you had a birthday. Appreciate yesterday. that. Yes, uh, sir. But uh, it may be an age thing because because the older I get, the more I change. I used to be pretty involved in activism. Me but too. I think, I think the longer I live, the more I see that corporations, you know, basically what we have right now, you know, you know, we basically have an illusion of a political system, um, an illusion of choice, and really, you know, kind of in the back doors, there's all these deals made by corporations. It's a, you know, when you when you give people this un um, unfettered access to capitalism, what ends up happening is you you just have these gigantic um, wealth hoarders who can who can just throw a little bit of cash and all the people who make the decisions and have right. those decisions go their way. So I, I think I think it's a little bit of a waste of time to argue over which bought and sold politician you're supporting because at, at the end, it's it's almost like if you have stomach cancer um, debating on whether you want to go eat McDonald's or Burger King. It's like you've got a bigger problem there. You right. Know? So well, that's it, my it really is. soapbox, you know? Well, yeah, but that's a very valid point, at least in my opinion. I mean... I get in these huge arguments with my mom, oh, yeah. because I'm because I'm like I'm like, dude, they're the same. I'm they're like, you're not watching. Same. I'm like, you're not watching Fox News, but you're watching whatever CNN or whatever MSNBC, whatever crap they're watching. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do you not hear that they're literally saying almost the same sentences? Just they're throwing mud at the other side, and they're wanting you to make they want you to think that they're being honest with you. And then you're going to tell me that the guy that watches Fox News, that he's wrong, but he's telling me the exact same thing about what you're watching. Yeah. I'm like, how do you take these people seriously? They're all puppets. And she's yeah, like, for sure. Well, you just, she's like, you just don't understand. You don't want to think about it. I was like, no, no, no. I want to think. That's the thing is I want to think. And they don't want me to do that. And well, I don't have knowledge on most of it. I don't want to. I no. don't, at this point, at this point, I'm half dead or more. I don't care. I want yeah. to just try to. Try to set my kids up for however I can. Now I'll vote when I can vote. I will listen when I can listen. But as far as anything, you know, anything major is concerned, I don't know that it's very realistic for me to sit here and go, I'm making change. Like I just what, that may seem really gross, but like it kind of is what it is. I, I I still believe in direct action. Um, you know, I've seen several instances of direct action um make change, you know, within the past 10 years. But if if your only answer is you know putting up a status on Facebook or you know right. it's, you're, you might as well just fart in the wind. You know? Well, you have to get off of social media and go do something is the only yeah. way to make any real things change. I mean, you can't make change on Facebook. I'm sorry. I know they want you to think that you can by checking a box or clicking a thing or signing a petition. Look, a petition maybe okay maybe, but like outside of that, like you can't make change unless okay so. I would say, you know who Punk with the camera is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think, yeah, I think, I think they're doing some good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. With social media. But, but it's, they're taking social media of their direct actions. They're out on the streets doing something. That's my point is that they're actually you know. using it in a way that I think can be beneficial for change, right? Sure. Whereas, whereas my place in social media is more or less uh, entertainment. I bring, yeah. 
people to the table. I have a platform for people that if you want to talk about this, by all means, bring it to the table. We could talk about it. But this is more of a interview, entertainment, uh, you know, information. Uh, I like to like document things and make little mini podcast uh, documentaries and such. Mm-hmm. So like that kind of stuff, right? I don't know that I have with a family. I can't go and do the things <laughs> that they're doing. I just simply cannot do it. Like it's yeah. not in my. Not that I, I, when I was in my twenties, dude, did I go hang out and do food drives? And did I was I not a part of food? Yeah, absolutely, bro. Sure. Like one hundred percent. I went and helped the homeless. I went and fed the needy. I did a lot of stuff. I went and did some protests in Austin. Got hit with uh, bean bags and pepper spray a couple times. Like I can't even remember what the fuck we were out there for. To be honest with you, I don't <laughs> even know, bro. It was twenty years ago. I, I can't yeah. remember yesterday, dude. And uh, so, you know, when you're young, you were much more willing to go out and do that you have more time and when you have more time you or you know should have more time if you live a long life you have more time so it's not as in is it's like to me my time is is valuable when i'm, I'm like oh i want to go hang out with my kids i want to go yeah i want to go film a set and go and have these memories and go put that up on my channel and ha- leave leave a lasting impression on people or, or at least leave something for people to look at and remember what we did today like i don't know it's this idea well, that i've got but you're you know, doing you're doing what you can do to to make a positive change in the world and it's not you know it's not realistic to think that that you as just a punk rock dude you know are are going to uh going to achieve world peace or whatever but you're doing what you can do and one of the biggest things i think you can do once you have children is just you know teach them to not be assholes which i'm sure well, you do it you know so that's actually i was going to get to that point and I wasn't sure if you were going to get there, I, you know, because I think that is what I can do is I can make sure that I've got three really sweet kids that are nice yeah. to people. Like, uh, I'm not going to get into the whole situation, but we have a bullying situation happening at my house. And we're not the ones that are bullying. It's happening to my kid. And so I went and talked to the kid's parent and I talked to my son. I was like, well, what do you want to do about it? And he's like, well, I just want to leave me alone. And I was like, well, what if he won't? And so we, we have our way. of do- So I'm trying to teach him like, well, look, man. If you have to protect yourself and it becomes a violent situation, it is what it is. I don't, I'm not going to get mad at you. I was like, but yeah. if I ever find out that you're like starting a situation like that, yeah, I was like, oh boy, you're going to have to answer to me. I was like, I'm not doing that shit. We're not bullies. You, you, I said nothing else. You can just take it and let it be what it is. And then when you're his boss one day, be like, fuck it, remember me? Like you know, <laughs> it, it is what it do. Turn around, fair play. The world will get what the world gives, and and you know, or gives what what it gets. You know, you you treat people like that, you will get treated that way in return. So. Sure. Uh, I don't want him doing that. I'd rather him just be a nice kid and, and, and he's really smart and he's doing well in school. But my point is, is that I'm, I'm doing the best I can to raise like polite, nice, accepting, uh, healthy children. You know, I try to get them to eat right, but I also let them have a little fun with their food and I try to get them to behave in school. But you know, if you don't, you know that you can, when do you want to do your homework? As long as you'll tell me when it's going to get done and it gets done, then I don't care. If you want to wait and play when you get home first and do your homework at night, because my kids like to be outside. Well, the rule is when the sun goes down, you come inside because they're not that are ten and nine, so they can't be outside past dark. Yeah. And so, you know, coming. So it, it's yeah, it's it's it. I could go on and on and on about my family. I try really hard. I'll put it that way. I really, <laughs> I really try hard. I try hard. I love my kids, and I'm a good dad, and I know that. So yeah. You are correct. That is what I can do. So, but let's 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 before we go any further, introduce yourself to my audience. Tell them who you are, what you're doing. Uh, so what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Punk Rock Review Podcast. This is the probably the weirdest intro i've ever done but i, I think i might try to do this <laughs> well when you have organic conversation it tends to be way better and i think i might do it this way from here on out because it was way way more just like oh this is easy let's hit record like we well, were in the middle I, of a conversation Boop. i, I want to tell you the reason why you know well there's several reasons but one of the major reasons why i was interested in your um you know your your struggle with addiction and and how long did you say you were sober uh, uh ten and a half years Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I have a sister who who passed away um, from uh, from several addictions, but mostly opioids. And um, so I'm so sorry. It's uh, always uh, it it feels good to me, you know, that she didn't she lost the battle. Right. So it it feels good to me uh, anytime I can hear somebody who who overcame, you know. Yeah. Uh, She she was uh, us growing up. You know, she was the straight A student. She was um, straight A's plus working yeah. full time. Uh, but the problem is, is she became a nurse, and uh, oh, 
it's just statistics. At this point, it's just statistics. You're, she's working evenings, long hours. Uh, she works around doctors who are loose with their prescription pads. It's all legal, so it doesn't seem seem wrong because it's not right. street drugs. Well, dude, that's a then major thing snowballs. about. That's a major thing I was dealing with. Was I was like, bro, it's not even that big a deal. I literally broke my ribs. I'm my doctor gave me these, and then I'm just like, yeah, but you took thirty days and worth of medication in like two, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, yeah. so. But yeah, it's I, I've lost a. Uh, uh, a pretty large number of friends to this stuff. If I was to sit here and think about it, I mean, it's, I couldn't count them all in two hands. That's I lost roommates to this shit, bro. Like I, I have friends that just, with, yeah, with, dude. Fent with fentanyl, it's getting really unfair oh. because you don't have to be a hardened junkie. You can just be somebody who's experimenting and you know, the well, experiment don't go well. I heard a story about a girl who she was a straight A student and she was getting ready to do, I don't know, some kind of testing. I want to say it was like senior finals or something, something big, something important. And her parents find her in her room deceased, and they're like freaking out because they don't know like what in the world. So they get an autopsy, and they're like, yo, your daughter was, she had fentanyl in her system, and her parents are like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So they go through her social media. They go through her friends, her phone. They can't find any, any, uh, reason to believe that she was doing any drugs come to find out she was so worried about this stupid test that she bought a single adderall oh yeah off, yeah. off of snapchat and she broke that in half and took that yep and that had fentanyl in it and it was so much in there that it killed her immediately so yeah man you can't even be like a regular person anymore it's too scary you have to just be straight laced man like so, so i i uh you know, I have issues with panic attacks and anxiety and stuff. And sometimes like when I go on tour, um, you know, I don't want to have a freak out ever, but I especially don't want to have a freak out on tour when I'm stuck in a van, you know? So it's been, it's been, you know, something that if somebody has some street Xanax, I'll buy a couple, not, not even to abuse it just in case I have a freak out moment. And those days are gone long. Gone. I'm not going to trust anything off of Dude, you can't, man. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. I I mean, I'm hearing that it's in weed now. Like, what? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't even under, I don't even understand it. Like, I I Man, just like the thought of anybody offering me any like I would say I would say no so fast. Like it is it nothing to do with my sobriety, man. Like I'm not I'm not a square, bro. Like I'm not a, I'm not opposed to like drugs like i'm not i'm not i'm just not i'm opposed yeah. to pharmaceuticals yeah because i know i know how i know how that system works but like you want to you want to smoke crack bro like i don't think you should but i'm not gonna <laughs> judge you i'm not gonna judge you for it dude right. i've done everything and anything man there ain't nothing out there i haven't done i can't you can't i i don't know of anything i mean i've i've taken fentanyl like i willingly so yeah. i know you know, I, I've taken every man, this episode is so getting demonetized, but uh, <laughs> look, on, the only no, look, no, hey, this is this is awareness, this is education. I mean, and I'm not even just saying that. I, I no, no, like, I, I I agree with that, and I will fight it if it does. And the only reason that I even care if it gets demonetized, people think that that means that I care about the money it would make, dude. Yeah. I have I have 4,100 subscribers, dude. I don't make money yet. Uh, it 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 depresses it from getting out to my viewers. That's why I care. Because if yeah. it gets demonetized, they'll take it and go, oh, well, it's not appropriate. So we don't want people seeing it. And they'll just hide it. And so people won't see the episode. It drives me freaking nuts. Yeah. I did a literal rancid album ranking. And they were like, ah, oh, something about this is inappropriate. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So they had to like manually review it and go, oh, never mind. Sorry. It's our bots doing that. I'm like, well, dude, <laughs> like, bro, this whole YouTube thing is weird, man. <laughs> it's very yeah. strange. But OK, OK. I got to stay on topic. Yeah, Introduce yeah. yourself and, and who you are, what you do, so they know what we're talking about here. And then we'll, we'll start um, talking about music. My name's Mike. Um, I think I can spin this around without screwing everything up. This is, I'm sitting in my record store right now. Yeah. You should be able to see that. Yeah. Oh, yours is way bigger than mine. <laughs> so it's a record store um, slash music venue. If you look directly behind nice. my shoulder there, that purple light all the way back there, that's, um, that's our stage. Dude, that's awesome. And, um, so, yeah, we're a music venue and a record store, um, and it's in Kokomo, Indiana. And uh, I've been a lifelong musician, um, you know, almost lifelong fan of 
punk rock music. Um, and I play in a band called Harley Poe, which is probably probably the most uh, well-known thing that I do. But I also play in a, a Grateful Dead cover band. I play yes. in a, um, a jazz, like a bluesy, jazzy thing called Davy and the Midnights with some really good musicians. And then um, I just started releasing music on my own. I've always, always wrote songs and all that, but um, I just lately, I mean, I play in three bands and none of those acts, I'm not the sole songwriter in any of those acts. So I'm kind of just writing music just for myself. Uh, there you go. You know, just for myself. So yeah, yeah. that's awesome, man. Make sure and give you all the links. I'll put them all in the description when we upload this. Uh, it yeah. will be on spotify and youtube i'm trying to get it on apple but i don't know that i really care about apple as much but i definitely was very proud to be able to get my stuff on spotify finally it took me i'm not a tech dude at all so like yeah. it took forever for me to figure out how to do this stuff man but um so for music for music we have a, a distribution channel that just puts it on everything for us it's not like that with podcasts it is, but you still have to do like applications and stuff with Apple specifically. Yeah. I'm on a bunch of different platforms now, but Apple's the one that I'm having trouble with. And it's like, I don't have like Apple. I don't use anything Apple. So I don't have any like Apple ID right. and this. And I don't have that information. So it's like, I don't even know if I want to go through the trouble of doing it, to be honest with you. Like, I just don't like that company anyway. So like, I don't really care, I guess. But Spotify yeah. is one. Well, I mean, why do I like Spotify? Because I use them. It's not because they're a good company. I just, that's, I'm comfortable. <laughs> right. <with>. But uh, <laughs> like, let's not get shit twisted here but like, i have a really really tiny little record shop uh if you give me a, a a p.o box or something i'll send you some of the 31 record stuff just i'll just send you a couple oh, of cool. each thing and you throw it on your shelf and you know Sweet. you know whatever at no yeah. cost of course but uh do how I, long have, how long have you been doing that label so i did some stuff in 2004 2005 2006 and then i stopped when i got you know super into extracurricular activities yeah. And then uh, <laughs> in 2022, it's funny, man, because I didn't, it wasn't, a, I wasn't, I never planned on having a channel. I never planned on having a label. I never planned on putting on shows. I never planned on having a shop, dude. Like it just kind of happened because this is in my blood, man. So yeah. in 2022, I was in the height of, of COVID and my channel was a different channel. I was doing like rap content. The whole shtick was like, oh, punk rock dude listens to rap. I review it, tell you what I think. And then I try to figure out what they're talking about. Like it was just kind of fun, right? But yeah. then it got, it, it kind of blew up. I had like 27,000 subscribers. We were doing really well. I was making some money. But the but the community was so toxic and gross. Like I, I hated it, bro. Every day making a video became a chore. Where with this channel, it's like I'm excited to see what I can do. I don't have enough time in the day to do all the stuff I want to do. But it was, and it was like the same kind of content, just different genre, right? What, so what and was the was the uh, just shitty comments or what? What, what was it was it? disgusting comments, bro. Like yeah. no matter what I did, I pissed off everybody. No matter what I said, I wasn't cool enough. No matter what I did, I wasn't right. And it was like, bro, I just and, and I don't have like a bunch of knowledge on it. Yeah, but I do have enough knowledge as a musician to understand some things. So I do have a certain amount of like like pedigree, I would say. So when I switch over to punk rock stuff, I'm okay with the fact that I don't know everything. And I think that's where it's <laughs> different. I'm just more comfortable in my own skin over here. Yeah. But like. They would have people that were like freestyling and I would go, that guy didn't freestyle that. He thought about that before he sat down. And they're like, no, dude, that's da da da. Well, if he doesn't have it written down, it's a freestyle. I'm like, well, that's legitimately not a freestyle. And I'm not going to argue about that shit. Like, what do I right. do? I don't. So I just, <laughs> I just bounced, bro. I just dropped that channel. So anyways, to get back to the label thing was I was doing TikTok stuff out of boredom. I was like making like album reviews and stuff on TikTok. Just, I didn't have a following on TikTok. I just had a couple hundred people. Right. And, uh, I ran into this song is a hip hop song, but it was very clearly done with like a punk rock spirit. It was called spooky bitches and it was around Halloween time. It was really catchy. So I like, I reviewed the whole song on my YouTube channel and I reached out to the guy thinking that he was already like in a, in a career. And so he does the podcast and in the podcast, I find out that he's like an old punk rock guy and he's doing rap shit just because that's what he can do by himself. Oh, he's nice. like, I don't want, He's like, I don't want to depend on a band anymore. I'm just doing this because I like making music. And I was like, so when I see him, it's very immediately obvious that he is from our same community, right? Yeah. And so I was like, hey, where can I buy some merch from you? And he's like, oh, I don't really have any merch yet. I, I haven't done anything. He's like, I, he's like, you just happened to find my first song that popped. And I was like, what? And it blew my mind. And so I was like, yo, I, I would put out a tape for you. Like, just on a, like I just kind of said it like, as an authentic comment. And so later on, he's like, hey, you got any interest in really doing something? And I was like, 
let me ask my wife first. And then she's like, <laughs> she's like, I don't care. Do whatever you want with your with your part of the money. Do whatever you want. And I was like, all right. And so I just started a label up at, just to help him out, kind of. And then I met another band and was like, oh, I like your music. And then I was like, hey, I'll work with y'all. And now I don't even do anything except punk music. And I, it's like, it's weird because my first release is like a rap release, but it wasn't planned. It was very organic. So I have no That's problem badass. with it. It's, it's yeah, it's, uh, so I put out, let's see, seven tapes and I'm working on, I did one co-release on vinyl. It's coming out in May. And then I got one that I, I'm re-releasing my very first ever release from 2004 on vinyl because we did it on CD and I still know those guys. And we've always wanted to do it on vinyl and I have the money as an adult that I didn't have as a kid. So, uh, <laughs> yep. you yeah. know, so I'm going to do some vinyl stuff and, you know, we're now we're doing the, the fest in June and we'll, we'll see, man. We'll see what happens. I don't have any like misconceptions about the fact that I'm just some DIY punker and I'm losing money on all of it, but it's fun and I have a good time and I'm helping some people and that's what matters. So, yeah. you know, and I signed some pretty good people and did some really good releases, man. I'm really proud of the shit we did. As a matter of fact, before I let, before I shut the fuck up and let you talk, uh, <laughs> I put out a tape. I'll show it to you right here. This is my latest release. It's a band called Generation Exit. They're from Austin. Nice. The singer, the singer was in a band called Born to Lose, and also in a band called Nowhere Bound. And Born to Lose just happens to be like a top five band all time for me. So when I linked up with this guy. This is like bucket list shit for me, man. Like, I know he ain't yeah. famous, but he's still one of my favorite songwriters of all time. And so now we're friends. I stayed at his house and on Sunday when I was filming that show. I, I stayed at his house on my birthday and chilled and shit. And like, that's my friend now. And it's like, that's what doing this does is you get to meet people you didn't know you're going to meet and you get to help people you didn't know you're going to get to help. It's it's not about money. It never was. I, I have I have friends that just don't really understand it because they're not quite in the same community as we are. And they just think it's wild, and I love talking to them about it. So if you're watching this, you know who you are, buddy. I love you, man. Uh, but yeah, okay, let's talk about your music, man. I, I need to shut up. My people are going to be like, bro, really? Did you show you? <laughs> so uh, I, I know I know, I talk too much. It, it, it's, it's not – it is what it is, folks. Deal with it. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, man. So first tell me about Harley Poe a little bit because I don't yeah. know a ton about you. I know who the band is. So when I saw that name, I was like, what? I was really surprised you reached out. Uh, yeah. Interesting music. Like haunting folky <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, man. Um, so in Kokomo, um, obviously small Indiana town. There's a, a big religious element here, and um, yeah. So Joe was Joe, the singer and songwriter from Harley Poe. He started this band called Calvaretto, and Calvaretto was. Do you remember Tooth and Nail Records? I do very much. Yeah, was, MXPX came up from on, the, on on that label, didn't they? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So Tooth and Nail basically was uh, it was like if you've got Christian parents and they won't let you listen to no <laughs> no, no effects. effects. Yeah, we, yeah. We've got we've got MXPX. <clears throat> and, yep. You know they would do Christian versions of other bands. Um, and I'm not speaking out of turn here because I think you know Joe would Joe would say this too. Um, they were kind of the Christian answer to the Violet Femmes. Uh, okay. Calvaretta was. Cool. That's and, awesome. Um, so they were they were on Tooth and Nail Records and um, playing a lot of shows. And then I was in a bunch of bands playing a lot of shows. We had a, a kind of a friendship through. I was in a band called In the Face of War, and okay. our our guitarist um, did some work with Joe. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, like basically just small town Indiana stuff. But, you know, we had a decent little scene of bands, but there were only a couple that would go out of state or tour. Dude, that stuff's hard to do. Yeah, and Cal Beretta was was one of the bands that was touring, and, and my band in the Face of War was one of them that was touring. Um, but then eventually Joe kind of lost his faith and wanted to start mm. writing songs about horror movies. That's awesome. And he, he, uh, <laughs> he submitted all these songs to his label that were about horror movies, and they were like, yeah, we're going to pass, you know? Yeah, and, Tooth and uh, Nail doesn't seem like the appropriate <laughs> home for that, I don't think. Well, uh, actually, I think Cal Moretto's last album was pretty influenced by, by horror stuff, but eventually, okay. I, I think Joe just saw as an artist that the, the writing was on the wall and that he wanted to shift. 
So, I mean, you know. So he started doing Harley Poe, and that went, you know, uh, I don't know. I think it's a – people say that it's really dark, but um, – I would say me, it's pretty dark, to well, me anyways. Yeah, I mean, people say, you know, I mean, there is some some topics on there that I guess, you know. But to me, like, maybe it's because I know Joe, but it's like – to me, it's all been tongue in cheek the entire time and been okay. kind of goofy. Uh, I mean, it helps somebody like me understand it better. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so you know, he was doing a lot of that stuff, and um, you know, me and him would see each other maybe at a show, but we weren't you know like pals or anything. And um, but then I started up my record store, which used to be on the south side of town, and it was okay. about two blocks from his house. Oh uh, wow. Yeah, and he uh, he got a divorce. You know, his his wife mm. left him and took the kids. And Ugh. this uh, this this girl that he was with, it was the only girl he had ever been with. He met her in high school. They were high school sweethearts. Like Whoa. literally, the only girl he'd ever been with. Um, Damn. They had, they had two boys, and um, the only relationship he's ever really known. And and um, she she left and and. Uh, he was just in a real bad place, man, and I don't I can imagine. He, I don't think he really had anybody to talk to, you know. And um, I was I was pretty close to his house, and so he used to come to the record store. And I'm a product of uh, multiple divorces on either side of the family, and all sorts of fucked up dysfunction within the family. So I think I was somebody that was easy to talk to, you know. And um, yeah. So he decided to, he decided he was done with the band. Um, he was done with Harley Poe, but then he started writing all these songs that had nothing to do with horror. It was basically just all about his um, his divorce, mm. and that be, that became the album Lost and Losing It. And uh, that's when I became a fan. I, I I wasn't necessarily a huge fan of all the horror influenced stuff, although I love horror movies and I love punk music. I love the Misfits, you know. Right. But but. Um, when he put out that album, I think it was because of all the conversations we had. Well, yeah, you were kind of on ground zero with that stuff. So you were very much, you knew what he was talking about in a deeper like way than your average listener might. Dude, it was very, very weird the first time I heard that album because it was, you know, he was singing about things that he had told me. And it was just, it's a lot different than if you just listen to somebody's album and you don't have a personal relationship with them, you know, and. Right. And when I when I heard those songs, it was pretty wild. Um, anyways, uh, as far as uh, me getting in the band, I was in this band, Nervous Burger. That uh, it's it's like a rock punk rock band. I was in a band, Nervous Burger, with Harley Poe's bassist at the okay. time. His name's Greg, um, and we had put out an album, um, <laughs> and uh, Joe got offered this tour to go go on tour with amigo the devil i don't know if you've heard of amigo the devil oh yeah yeah but but um so it was, it was a big big thing for him and um greg's daughter unfortunately got hit by a car um he took her he took her to college took her to arizona she was in arizona for less than 24 hours she was walking across the street and and got hit by a car it was terrible um oh and me and me and greg were good friends at that point um, he played bass for Harley Poe and he was like, Hey dude, I'm, you know, I need you to play bass on this tour. Cause I'm going to have to basically live in Arizona and help my daughter rehabilitate. Wow. Oh man. She made it through the, the accident though. Well, um, yes, but Ugh. it was a very, very long journey probably. And she's still probably not at a hundred percent, but they, they went from <clears throat> that she was going to die. Um, to she'd never walk again to now she walks and she, you know what I mean? She's, she's probably not a hundred percent, but I would say she's probably 85, you know, dude, and, the, uh, the power of the human mind is something to behold, bro. Yeah. It, 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 she had a, a, an amazing support system. Her boyfriend stood by her the whole time. It was a whole Facebook group of people supporting her. And, and, uh, but Greg actually, Greg actually went out there for a while and had the ability to come back into the band and tour. He played, uh, since I was doing bass, he did uh, melodica, some bells and some keys and stuff. Nice. But, uh, but anyways, man, I've been, I've been, um, 
with the band ever since. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and and so you know, usually about once a year we we go out on tour. Joe's not a big fan of of touring, you know. Um, so about once a year we do that, and then um, we've released several albums since then. But uh, but yeah, yeah. I know a lot of folks that like y'all's music, and Amigo the Devil is one. Like, okay, this is going to sound so crazy probably, but I'm like sort of religious. I wouldn't call myself, I don't go to like church or anything. I probably yeah. should, but I, I, I just, I don't like the, uh, I guess the organization of all of it bothers me. That's me but, too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like Amigo the Devil talks about a lot of stuff that I don't really fool with. So like I know of him and I've heard his music. So when you said him, I knew it. It's it, There's this like brand of like music that that falls into and it's like this like haunting haunting is the way i describe it. it's haunting it's like haunting folky i don't know man i, I do enjoy it like aesthetically though like i like the sounds i like the there's there is some songs of his that i that i've heard and like and, and listen to i just dude i don't he, know in real life he is such a goofball and, and oh like, most of those kind of guys are at his concert speaking about musicians <laughs> at his concerts he'll he'll cover um like Carrie Underwood songs. Oh, wow. And, and uh, he does a lot of things, you know, I mean, obviously the music's real deep and it can be haunting, but he'll do a lot of things to like keep the levity there and and, and keep it from being too dark. And Well, I, I don't claim to know a lot about it either. I just, on the surface, I see stuff and go, well, there's 20 million things out here for me to choose from. So I have to sit right. through it somehow. Uh, it's probably ignorant on my part to a certain degree, I would even say. I mean, it is what it is. I'm not going to claim that I'm somebody I'm not. But uh, yeah, I, I I probably should go listen to his new record. He's got a new one, doesn't he? It's like only like a few weeks old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't I listened I've, to it either. But yeah. some of my buddies were telling me it was really really good. Like some of the lyrics were really great. So I'll probably give it a listen, man. I, I don't want to be like uh, I don't want to be closed minded at all. You know, I just have like a uh, people don't understand. At least the way I feel, anyways, is if you surround yourself with something, whatever <clears> that something <throat> is, that's how you're gonna start thinking and behaving. It's just like if you go hang out with a bunch of street punk kids, all of a sudden you're gonna have a spiky jacket on. It's just gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna true. have some fucking blue hair, you know. And if you hang out with a bunch of racists, you're gonna turn into a racist. And you nothing you can do about it, man. So don't surround yourself with those kind of people if that's not what you want to be like. Yeah. You know. So so that's the way my brain works, and I probably just put that into overdrive on everything. I try to stay away from certain things because I'm easily influenced, man. I know that. I know that, man. I, I mean, yeah. I would say a lot of punk rockers are easily influenced. It's, you know, we found something that's like bright and shiny and colorful that we like, and we <laughs> attach ourselves to it. But yeah, hey, I was, I was, I was listening to you a minute ago. I was digging through CDs that I bought the other day. Whenever I was thinking about talking with you, this band popped up in my head, and then like two seconds later, their CD popped up in front of me at a record store. Have you ever heard of Two Galants? Who? It's called Two Galants. No. Well, I think I've heard of them. I've never listened to them. It reminds me of what the kind of music y'all make. Oh, cool. Yeah, I just it just happened that I knew I was talking to you, and then I was thinking of other bands that are like in the same vein, and I thought of them, and literally it like materialized a CD at a record store. I was like, what? So I just bought it. It's like it's called uh, let's see, what the Toll Tells, nice. but it's uh, folky, like haunting country punk situation it's it's good but this is like i mean shit probably yeah 2006 almost 20 years old it's good mm. it's good stuff yeah yeah a lot of this stuff man i saw your uh i saw your interview with uh sister wife sex strike and, oh um, so good th that band is uh, it's cool man it's cool to see you know it's cool to see them and it, have you ever listened to apes of the state so i've had her on the show too yeah april april's super awesome and uh I have a lot of respect for her. There's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of younger people that are are getting into like the folk punk thing now and really um, taking it forward, you know, in a really cool way. I agree. Um, I, I mean, it's like I don't think you know I don't think twenty twenty five years ago or whatever it was, Joe wanted to create some kind of new movement. You know, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think Billy Bragg ever had some kind of like movement in mind or the Violent Femmes or the Pogues or like any of these like kind of older bands, but it seems like the, the kids now, they are very much focused in like branding themselves as folk punk 
Um, oh, yeah. Having a set of values that are folk punk values. And like, yeah, um, it's interesting to see to where like, like we were kind of just playing music and it was just, we were playing acoustic punk rock, you know, and we, we had our, our punk rock ideals and everything, but it wasn't, uh, when I see these kids coming out now, it's like, uh, they're very invested in it socially, um, just as much as they are musically, you know, well, it reminds me of how I felt when I was like 15 years old and I was, you know, I was really heavily into the punk scene, you know, so well, it's cool to see. That's exactly what it is. I mean, it is now an established so genre of punk rock and yeah. they are basically crust punk kids that don't have enough money or desire to tote around a bunch of equipment. Yeah. Uh, and have, they want to have fun. They want to be, they want to party. They want to treat everybody the same. I haven't met one that was a, shithead yet nope. uh, i've met plenty with problems but i haven't met anybody that was just like an outright prick uh they don't they don't use deodorant enough i'll put that out there <laughs> you know you know well that's part that's, of that that's whole my only crusty... problem with these with these little folk punkers where's well, like goddamn deodorant that's it you know i i don't know i don't even know where that comes from but i do know that's an issue i think it's just a money <laughs> thing it started out that way anyways and it's probably morphed into some kind of like we don't want to support colgate as a company or some nonsense <laughs> but like <laughs> Uh, I've met a lot of folk punkers and I've known a lot of like crusty homeless kids and train riders and shit. Like it's, it's a culture now, man. And, and, and some kids, they like, you know, bands like days and days who honestly at this point are like the OGs, like they've been around for a hot minute and like, yeah. you know, I have Pat the bunny who doesn't even do it anymore. There's a whole bunch there. This is like the second wave of this stuff. As far as I'm concerned, like yeah. maybe even third, the sec, second, like official wave of this kind of music. And it's getting better and better. And the people that are doing it are like, I don't know, people that I'm proud to associate with. Like everybody that's been on this channel is, is amazing. And is welcome to come back at any time they want to, uh, assuming that they have that desire. I love it, man. It's music that I can get behind because I think we all feel weird and lonely and outcast, even in our own groups. Right. Right. So we just make yeah. a different group and then that group becomes a big group. And within that group, they make some different groups and then those become bigger. It's just, it's just a circle, man. It is what it is. Uh, you know, I I'm, never, I'm, I, so, so, so you're 43, 42, 42. Yeah. I'm 39. And I, you know, I never thought that I would come to see the day when punk rock music, the barrier of entry on regular punk rock music is too hard to climb now. Because if you listen to, let's say you listen to um, even an unknown punk rock band. Okay. Um, they had to go to like a professional studio. They had to have, um, you know, you got a, a Marshall half stack. That's, that's a good thousand bucks. You know, a guitar, yeah. that'll, a guitar that'll stay in tunes, a good five, six hundred bucks. You know, you got to put all this shit in it most of the time you have to have like a giant van or, you know, you know what I mean? And it's like, um, that's, that's what I think is so cool about folk punk is like, you can literally just show up with an acoustic guitar. Dude. The only guitar I have is an acoustic guitar. Your barrier, your barrier of entry is like 300 bucks. If you already have a phone, there's people who record full albums on Joe put out a full album on his iPhone. You know, it's like, well, <clears throat> I, I think that, I said okay, so so the, the having like the having to buy a stack, a half stack, whatever, and a good amp and a, a a good guitar. While yes, that is a pain in the butt. I do think there's something to be said for like working hard and getting to that sure, point where you sure, can get yeah, it. Yeah. But I I do feel like if you want to start out and just grab an acoustic, and then that's just the lane you find yourself the most comfortable in. By all means, dude, stay in that lane. You don't have to graduate to electric guitar. Like it doesn't matter. Right. You don't have to get. Like you can get a three piece drum set and and be okay. You can get honestly, you can probably just get like a kick, snare, and hi hat and be fine and do some pretty. I mean, that's what rockabilly shit was for like twenty years. Oh, like yeah. it was like, dude, go listen to any Stray Cats album. There is no variety in those drums at all except the rhythm <laughs> he's playing. Like it's that's the only difference. And uh, you know, I mean, it, dude, it's all the same if you think about it. Though all this music is exactly the same. It's angry. It's desiring some kind of change and it's also fun yeah you know what i'm saying if you i'm doing an episode on the on so every week i try to do a guest and then the normal thing with my buddy rob 
And we're doing an episode tonight on the Ramones. And I like Ramones core, but I've never been a Ramones fan. Uh, my favorite band's Rancid. I don't like The Clash. So, like, I'm kind of an odd dude, like, anyways, within punk rock. How much have you listened to The Clash, though? Enough to know I don't like them. <laughs> I've had two of their albums in my possession that I owned, and then I had the Joe Strummer in the Mescaleros that was orange. And I've listened to those a number of times all the way through, and I just don't like it. My buddies, I have many friends that think I'm an idiot for this, but whatever. No, it's I my, love, my... I love, I, dude, me and you, our tastes are are, are aligned a lot. I, you know, I grew up in, in the rancid, no effects, the fat right. records, that whole era. So well, I, being I, this age, it's kind of, that was our yeah. entry level music was that stuff. That's, I mean, no effects, rancid and MXPX were the first three albums I bought. Yeah. So, you know, but, uh, yeah, man, like, well, my point was, is that, uh, with the like rock and roll and punk rock stuff we're, we're doing this ramones episode and like i'm learning so much about these older bands because when i was young i didn't care about the older bands i just didn't i didn't care i didn't didn't i didn't care about the ramones i like the sex pistols um because they had like snotty vocals that i liked because they sounded like you know the u.s bombs was a band i really like so they, oh, yeah. they sounded kind of like sex pistols and now but like going back and listening to all this ramones stuff i'm figuring out like oh man they were just as influential on street punk as they were like other kinds of punk and i never realized that but i don't think they were ever trying to be a punk band like no no bro like i i no. am now of the mindset that maybe they weren't the first punk band and if they were it was a fluke man like it was they totally, were trying to be rock stars i mean that's that's the only way to really create something original is to you know they were not trying to be i mean there was no the, the term punk didn't exist you know right so it's like they were trying to make um 50s they were trying to make 50s revival pop music yeah greaser like yeah like like that movie uh grease grease with john travolta they were like <laughs> yeah. that's like their favorite shit like well, that and, kind of and stuff. the beach boys it's the beach yeah. boys influence on them is is pretty <clears throat> clear but, yes you know for some reason they decided to do it with leather jackets and marshall stacks which you know you know in hindsight was a great accident i'm happy yeah i, yeah. I will say this i like a lot of their music more than i thought i did I liked, I still like their first record the most, I think. And I'm going to get into this later with Rob. So anybody that's hearing this for a second time, my apologies. But like, uh, yeah, man, I don't know, dude. Punk rock is a weird thing in general, though. Like, all of it's weird. The label of it is weird, but it, it is necessary. You have to have the label. People can say whatever they want, but you have to have the label. Without the label, none of it really makes any sense. Like, yeah. like you know, uh, I don't know. Punk rock's the only thing. Tell me if I'm wrong about this. I, I might be, but I, I feel pretty passionate about this statement punk rock is the only genre where people still to this day in any kind of punk rock it could be folk punk plugged in street punk uh, ska punk whatever people make the music lose their ass financially and they're just fine they're happy they don't care they want to keep making the records they want to save up and put their album out man hey i'll just do it on tape then if i can't do it on vinyl i'll do it on cassette they want to oh, i'll just drop it digitally it doesn't matter and they, they, they want to put out the album and spread the word play the shows and they're not concerned about getting a paycheck they got their regular ass day jobs. Like metal ain't like that. Metal, you want to make some money so yeah. you can go tour and be a metal band. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I still feel like that makes punk and punk adjacent music the only true like art form within well, music. I think that's I think that's where the morality aspect comes in. You know, punk rock seems to have like other genres, like you said, metal. Metal, there's no real morality trip. No, there's a lot of piece of shit people in metal yeah metal people are not like going to a protest you know in support of palestine they're you right. know they're they're trying to uh, bang a chick or get drunk i don't know they're doing other things you know what i mean and there's nothing wrong with that stuff either man. sure party, sure party hard andrew wk rules but like yeah you know uh, but but i think i think because you know because there's that morality aspect uh to the punk rock thing it's like i don't care if i lose money i don't care if this doesn't go anywhere this right. is like this is something that I feel inside of me that I have to do, you know, and I, I think that's why you see it, it prevalent. But but it's not, you know, I've played in genres of many, many different genres of music and different bands and stuff. And um, I, I think the DIY aspect is alive in in many genres. You know, there's people who are yes. just people who are just passionate about, you know, um, I don't want the factory to be to define my life 
You know, I, sure, but I would say that their goals are different oftentimes. How, how do you mean? Well, because I think for most genres, even though they're doing a DIY, their end of the day, their goal is to make money. Yeah, mo- like, ultimately, like, yeah. So, like, metal, goal, make money. Rap, goal, to make lots of money. Yeah. Pop music, goal, to get signed and go on this big ass tour. Like, and I'm not saying there's anything right or wrong about any of sure, it. I don't want to, sure. I'm not, I like pop music. I like some metal and I like tons of rap stuff. So, like, there's no, like hatred coming my way. I just think that it it's it feels so real and right and honest to me personally. And there's piece of shit people in punk rock too, dude. Plenty of them. Yeah. So I'm not absolving punk rock of any kind of wrongdoing. I'm just saying that I still feel like it's the only place where you can go get true blue art. It's everything in punk rock is still so DIY for the most part. Even with bigger labels, the bands are still like, well, we're only going to do this if we have control over everything. Yeah, well, we don't. Well, then we'll just go over here. And then you have bigger bands that like they blow up, they get on the major, they get a little bit of money and recognition, and then they go right back to a small label so they can get back. Well, now that we have a little bit of a following, now we want to do our thing again and go on tour on these smaller with these smaller labels backing us. And and if any backing at all, it's mostly just their name at that point. And, uh, you know, I, I think I don't know. I, I do think there's a little bit. We take it a little too serious with that shit because it's still at the end of the day, a business. Uh, yeah, and, well, it's so, just, and you can't get mad at somebody for making money. Like you can't tell me that. Yeah. Oh well, no effect sucks because they made some money. It's like, well, dude, they did this for 25, 30 years before they made any money. Like, what are you they, talking they, about? They also took a lot of motherfuckers with them, uh, including, you know, days and days. You know what I mean? So it's like, yes, it, you can't you can't help somebody if you don't have resources to help them with. So right. I don't know. It, it's not about like it's a it's not about money it's it's more about like what resources are you doing, what are you doing with your money if you're if you're yeah. if you're able to profit off of this scene and you're able to to you know because you are at the end of the day you're you're taking money from the punk rock community from the fans yeah are you just using that money to buy yourself multiple lamborghinis or are you doing what fat mike did and fat mike is pulling people literally from the streets and giving them a national and international sometimes spotlight. So it's, you kind of, it's hard to hate on that in my opinion. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, like we said earlier, and I don't know if we were recording yet, but I said like, I was going to make sure the bands got paid, especially the out of town bands. Oh shit. Where'd he go? Phone call probably. Sorry, folks. We'll be right back. This cold is kicking my butt, man. I'm sneezing and oh, I've had this for like two and a half weeks. I think it's not even a cold. I think it's allergies. I know I'm just sitting here by myself talking right now, but as you know, I can talk, bro. If I can do anything good, it is run my mouth. So, but uh, this dude's awesome, man. What a fun conversation. I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. I love doing this channel. I meet some amazing people. Oh, I bet his phone died. I bet the battery died because he hasn't hit back yet. It's all right. I'll probably cut this out.
holding a title generally gives champions the benefit of the doubt when it comes to how fans perceive upcoming challengers. It's not to say that we think they can't lose, but having that top spot in the sport carries weight. And so most of the phone died. I, yeah, that's what I was like. I was like, either got a phone call or your phone battery died. <clears throat> it's not a problem. It happens more often than you think. Yeah. That's what the that's why I don't do these live anymore, by the way. I used to do them live and it would just be like stupid shit would happen. But are, are we just jumping back in or do you have to like cut and splice or no, we're good, bro. I, I never oh. stopped recording. I'll edit it and post. Oh, cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, well, this won't even be live for like a week or two. So yeah. Um, I forget what we were talking okay. about. Oh, yeah, we were talking about like like Fat Mike and no effects. Well, like just kind of like money and labels and stuff. And like I was telling you earlier, like I was going to make sure the bands got paid in June with that show I'm putting on, even if I have to come out of pocket, because it's not about my money. Yeah. If I wanted to do this for money, I would be I would be in the wrong business, man. Like I want to put out records and albums and tapes and CDs and all that stuff just because I like it. Like that's the ultimate. Well, not just that. I want to help bands out, of course. If I didn't want to help a band out, I certainly wouldn't shovel thousands of dollars into them. But, like, <laughs> you know. That's uh, ex it's exactly how I feel about my record store. My record store is I sell records to to pay the rent, but it's a community building. You know, it's, yep. it's basically, you know, we're in a small, religiously kind of oppressive town that doesn't have many outlets for artistically minded people. Right. And um, this place is host all ages shows. We've hosted drag shows, comedy shows. Nice. We're, we're kind of like a catch all for a community that doesn't have a lot of places for artistic expression. And I'm not, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just trying to like uh, explain that, you know, it's like, yeah, we have to, we have to make money to survive. Well, yeah. But I mean, it's, gotta... it's what you do with that money, you know, it, it, that is important at the end of the day. So. One thousand percent. I have a small little record shop too. It's only open on the weekends. It's not big enough to be, you know, hosting any kind of shows or anything. But I have any local to Texas punk band. I will buy their stuff and put it in my store. I don't need to be giving it for free. I'll buy it. Uh, you know, I, I I give people discounts without having to be asked to do so. Like you come in, you got four records. Well, let, here, is it, how's this work for you as far as the price? And yeah, that, that's that's way better. You know, like yeah. I don't know. It's 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 more of like a I want to make sure the bills are paid. Once the bills are paid, my my hobby is making sure people get music. So that's, <laughs> that's where this cost is. Like it's like I'm paying for this. It's my hobby. It's what I do. Everybody has a hobby. That hobbies aren't free usually, you know. So yeah, unless you're like a wood carver and you just well, then your knives aren't free. Like there's all kinds of costs <laughs> in doing anything. So uh, you know, it's it's, a, it's, it's, way, a, it's way more satisfying than like having a bowling league or like you know. Oh, I would. I mean, you know. I love bowling. I don't do it anymore, but like bowling. But yes, I would say it's it's way more satisfying for for any number of reasons, though. I mean, like, what's cooler than being like, "Hey, come to my record store. And we'll spin some some albums and just like hang out." Like, that's the coolest thing I can imagine telling somebody as far as work related stuff. Mm -hmm. Hey, come to my record store. Let's listen to some albums and hang out and talk. Go grab some lunch. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, how else would you? What else do you want to do on a Saturday? Like, that's <laughs> like, maybe go to a show. You know, yeah. go to a show, but like otherwise, I want to listen to some records and hang out and talk music, man. And maybe discover a new band I didn't know before today, and maybe maybe show somebody a band they didn't know or whatever. There's there's so many great musicians out there. It's it's and it's impossible to find and support them all. But you know, yeah, it gives us something to do. You know, do what you can. Yeah, for sure. Right. What's your solo stuff? What 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 do you uh? What is your goals with that? How long are you putting anything on wax or cassette or CD or anything? Or, or, or so, um, so far I've done two EPs, and then um, I'm also going to start doing singles as well. Um, and basically, Harley Poe doesn't go on tour until August. Now, I do have two other bands that I play in. Um, one does tour a little bit, but the other one's just weekends. Okay. Um, so basically I just have time right now until August where I can write record. So, so I, I record at, at my record store. I've got a little studio in the back. Um, so I can just do it all myself or with the help of some friends, you know, I've got a lot of musician friends. So if I need something done, um, people are nice enough to, to help out play drums or something like that. But, um, 
But basically, I just want to bank up a bunch of music and, you know, maybe eventually <clears throat> when I get into a situation where um, where I'm not as busy, then I can think about like the whole performing live thing and the whole sure. band thing. But at this point, I'm just, I just want to release music and, you know, hopefully have some people listen to it. And then, uh, you know, like, like us growing up, you know, you would foot soldier, go out and play live for, for any person that you could find who would, who'd be willing to listen. Nowadays, I, I feel like that it's kind of switched where, you kind of want to build your audience um, online first before you go play shows. Um, so, so people will actually show up to the shows because yeah, I mean me as a business owner, um, you know, and, and as a, as a venue um, it's fine if you play a show here and nobody shows up to see you play. I, I understand because I'm a musician and I, I know how that works, but right. But I obviously like it a lot better if, if you have 20 people here and that, you know, 10 of them buy a record. That's better for me to, you know, pay my bills or whatever. So I'd like to put myself in a situation where when I go out to play a show, I know I'm not wasting the venue owner's time per se. You know what I mean? There's, right. there's actually going to be people that, that come. And and so at least that's where my mind set is right now. It could change tomorrow. I don't know. but That's but, awesome. Yeah. I mean, whenever you have like your friends jump in on music, in my, at least in my experiences, people just like to do that anyways. So as long as you're like, if you're going to release it to some extent, let's say you're going to do it online or on like a cassette tape, they're yeah. like, yo, just throw my name on there so people know I did that so that maybe I can get more work doing it later. Like, it's not even about recognition. It's about opening doors. And For so sure. people like, just put my name in there, man. I just want to have my name on the liner notes so people can know I did that. Also, I can show my kids one day or show my friends, or my mom, whatever, man. I mean, yeah. I'm proud of the stuff that I do. Whenever I send a band an email, I go, hey, man, uh, I'm doing the artwork. I'm doing the layout for your for your cassette or your whatever. Uh, send me any kind of thank you list you want me to put in there or whatever information you want on the inside. And then in there, they put like my name and my label. I didn't ask them to do that. I'm not going to make them do that. But when they do it, I think it's awesome. Even though I'm yeah. putting it out, I still think it's cool. Like I'm like, this is so rad that they care enough to say thank you about that. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm lucky to be able to put the rate record out or whatever, right? So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people that have big heads though. I, I've, I've, in doing this, I've met some people that I was like, man, I really hoped you were going to be cooler, you know. And I've also <laughs> met plenty of people that. Well, like, you know, not like a douche about stuff. Like, bro, you're sure. gonna be you're not you're not any better than anybody else because you have the label. Like, you're just not like you're probably yeah. more broke than everybody, actually. Like, what are you doing, man? But uh I've met some really great people too, man. Shout out to Crossbar Records. Those dudes have been really cool. Uh but yeah, I like the DIY-ness of all the stuff that we do, man. The the podcasting, the records, the live shows. I mean out of all my group of like really close friends, I'm the only one that's like, Hey, I'll put out a record. I don't care. I'm the only one that's like, I'll, I'll, throw, I'll put on a show, like whatever. Like, yeah. Uh, well, what do I got to do to do it? I don't fucking know. Let me, let me go figure it out. You know, I'll just go figure <laughs> it out. Like, and, I, uh, I feel like we, we growing up, we had to, there was, if you wanted to have like, we threw shows when I was 15, man, we, there was a, an abandoned movie theater in town and it had, it had four theaters. And in uh, basically a bunch of people took, uh, you know, the collective scene or whatever, took over that place. And in one of the um, theaters, we had punk rock shows. Uh, one That's of awesome. the theaters, one of the theaters, we had wrestling. Um, I forget what happened to the other two. But I've actually got kind of a <clears throat> funny story about that, man. 16 years old. Um, there's this new up and coming band that just got signed to Fat Records from Chicago called rise against <laughs> and uh 16 years old i think their guarantee was like 300 bucks you know and it was like well we can get this fat records band for you know a couple hundred bucks and all we got to do is do five dollars at the door it's probably we had booked them you know months in advance um comes time for like the the week or the weekend or the day of the show our little punk rock venue was completely rained out. There was like some hole in the roof. Oh. Everything was everything was fucked up. 
Um, so the only thing we had available was the was the wrestling room. So we had Rise Against play on a wrestling ring. And if That's you know funny. any if you know anything about wrestling rings, they're not very solid. They're no, they bounce. So you know, Marshall stacks and stuff like that were just you know it, it felt like the show was gonna was going to explode at any point, but luckily. Yeah, that's scary, actually. I didn't consider that. <laughs> luckily, that's it went terrifying. Well. But I take, I say all this just to say, it's like when we were 15, like we 15, 16, 17, we wanted to play fucking shows and we weren't, we weren't going to let the fact that, um, you know, you could only play shows at bars, which we weren't allowed to get into. We weren't going to let that stop us, you know? Right. So, so I think what you're doing and what I'm doing, like with your record store and with your, label and everything is just an extension of that it's hey i want to do this and um i'm not gonna ask for permission i'm gonna fucking do it you know dude that's that's it right there i'm not gonna ask if i can i'm just gonna go out and do it like i mean i do dude it's just so much fun bro like i i don't even want like a pat on the back i just want people to come and hang out like that's it i don't care yeah. about recognition uh, is it cool when I when I'm at like a place and somebody goes, "Oh, hey, I've seen your YouTube channel." Man, that makes me feel great. Of course it does. But yeah. I don't need that. I don't give a shit, man. Like whatever. I'm gonna do the videos whether a hundred people watch them or a hundred thousand. It doesn't matter. I'm still gonna make them. Yeah. Uh, whether I sell ten copies of a tape or or all of them, I'm gonna still make them. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the show in June. Hopefully, get some uh, mix up the audiences with these bands and have a little bit of uh, maybe do a, a, a an exclusive shirt for the show or something and, and have it. You know, I do my own merch too. I do. I, that's the thing, man. When we were kids, dude, that's how I learned how to do all this stuff: is being young and not having any kind of help. And yeah. So I've made I've been making shirts my whole life. So I screen print my own shirts. I could have made this shirt no problem. Like this is easy, <laughs> easy peasy, bro. Like that's easy, easy, easy. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to probably design it up and make up, you know, make like 20 or 30 shirts to bring up there. I got to have different sizes or I'd probably make 15, but, uh, you know, I doubt, I doubt I'm going to sell 30 shirts, but we're going to make a bunch. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got to have an, all sizes, man. It does, that's the problem with shit like this is when you think about stuff like shirts, you're like, okay, I got to have at least two smalls and then I got to have at least four or five medium, four or five large, four or five extra large, and then a couple of double XLs. So at minimum, you're like looking at like 20 shirts you got to make. So, you know, you're, you're, you're yeah, dude. <laughs> dude, by, by, by the end of a Harley Po tour, dude, when we get to like, you know, three, four days before we get home, it's a fucking mess in that, you know, it'll be like, people will come up to the table and it's like, uh, well, we've got two extra small of this design. We've got a medium in this one. Yep. I think we've got five XLs over here, you know, and it's, <laughs> it gets to the point where I have to tell people like, well, hey, you can make a patch out of the XL. You can make a back patch, or you know what I mean. Dude, like I don't, you know, it's. I, li I literally have a teenage bottle rocket shirt that's a small because I bought it thinking like, well, I'll just cut it out and sew it on a flannel and rock that. Like it yep. is what it is. Like, yep. Do with what you got, man. Like you can't be, you know, expecting things that are unrealistic in a band going out on tour and making, you know, five hundred of every size is just unrealistic. Sometimes you're at the end of the tour. It is what it is, man. Like. Yeah. Uh, thank goodness for online ordering though, because I can make the order. I'll tell people like, here, here's the design. You tell me what size, and I'll go get the shirt out of my out of my shed, and I'll print it and send it to you. Like that's, <laughs> that's how. I, well, that's how I do it now. Is I just go tell me what size, and I'll go get it out of my shed and I'll make it. I don't have to order anything if I don't want to. I can just whatever I got available, I can make them on those, and that way when I get down to like three or four of a size, I just make an order for that size and get ten or twenty shirts, and I don't have to spend a crazy amount of money. It's I figured it out now. I used to make them in advance. That is the wrong move, man. Unless you're taking them somewhere, of course. But, you know, yeah. It's, it's, punk rock is a weird thing, bro. <laughs> it's so strange. Yeah. Okay. There you are, I think. Oh, did shit. Did it freeze up? I thought, I, I was like, he's being really, really still. No, it, it, it froze up. It froze up. Okay. I asked you, um, <laughs> were you, do you do silk screen or do you do heat, heat press? Silk screen. Oh, cool. Sweet. Yeah. Dude. Okay. So let me see if I can even make it happen. You know what? I'm not going to even try because it's on a, my camera's on a tripod. I'll send you a photo. Like, okay, if you look to my right, I'm in the master bedroom of my house. I have transformed the walk-in closet. It's a print shop. Like, it's oh, not nice, like, bro. It's that's all I do in that closet is print shit, man. I got, I got shelves I put on the wall with ink and squeegees and fucking. I got, <laughs> uh, yeah, dude. Like, I, I 
we used to we used to do all of our all of our shirts back in like the early 2000s i don't know how you guys used to do them but we used to make any shirt you had it had to be able to be stenciled on cardboard spray painted on a shirt if it if you couldn't stencil it make a different design because yeah. we didn't nobody knew how to screen print and then when we figured out how ain't none of us had the money for even one screen so like <laughs> we would go get like frito lay boxes and draw on the underside where it was the brown part draw the logo cut it out and then spray paint 10 or 20 shirts before the thing was all gummy then throw that one away and do another one so you go to a show and the shirts didn't even look the same all the way through like they weren't uniform which i thought was great i liked it yeah yeah unique yeah yeah, yeah we uh we've done various things but i'm lucky enough that especially with harley poe um a friend of mine that a friend that i've kept since i was 15 <laughs> years old has his own screen printing business nice and he's like super reasonable and i yeah i mean he 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 bangs shit out he him and his wife got married and they both had a house um and they just converted one entire house into a, a screen printing facility like their you know their uh their tub is their spray unit you know they've got heating machines in there and uh that's smart man if i had an extra yeah. little like house like this i would absolutely do something like that yeah where yeah, we if I could get like a little small place, oof, that'd be amazing. Yeah, where we kind of like took the music more serious and kind of started touring and stuff. That he took that more serious and kind of turned it into a business. You know, I've met a few people that did that over the years. Uh, I talked to a band called The Havoc, and the, the guy I spoke to, he that's what he does. He does is he does screen printing, and uh, yeah, it's cool, man. I like to and I like to know people that do this other stuff because if I run into a problem, I can shoot like an email, like, hey, man. How do I fix this? Like I've had to ask that guy a couple of questions. Like, hey, why is this? Why am I having this problem? And he's like, oh, it's because of this. Because he's got like a big facility, like you said. I do mine all by hand. So, yeah. uh, he's like, hey, try doing it like this. Boom, fix it. I was like, oh, thank you so much. But uh, the the punk rock community is a very social, and in my experience, there's always going to be turds. But like most people are pretty nice and pretty welcoming. I haven't had very many situations where I, you know, I took my my daughter. She's nine. And on her eighth birthday, we went and saw Streetlight Manifesto and Catbite. And oh, then, nice. Yeah, and then when she turned nine, we went and saw Days and Days at like a squat. And my <laughs> wife was like, are you fucking taking your kid? I was like, hell yeah, I'm taking her. And when we get there, they're all everybody there was like, oh, shit, that little kid's awesome. She has pink hair and shit. Yeah. And, uh, and then now I'm taking all of them to go see Rancid and Green Day because it's freaking Rancid, dude. Like, why would I not take them to that? Uh so I got little budding punk rock kids, man. Hopefully they'll learn how to make stuff on their own, not not depend on other people so much. But I we'll see. Seen, I haven't seen Rancid or Green Day in easily 15 years. Are you talking about that show with the Smashing Pumpkins? Yeah, so I got really lucky, dude. The Smashing Pumpkins aren't playing the leg down here. So I, oh. I hate that fucking band. So I don't <laughs> like... <laughs> like, so it's just Linda Linda's and then Rancid and Green Day as far as I know. Nice. But Green Day's playing like two albums plus worth of material from my understanding they're playing dookie and american idiot in their entirety and then in between that they're playing like a hits like set That's like cool, man yeah i'm gonna go film a lot of that so I'm, I'm excited for that show but you know how how did you get into punk rock stuff did you was there a show that you remember first going to or did some kid give you a tape or, or how'd, how'd you get introduced to this stuff man i i um i came from a family that was you know kind of dysfunctional and several divorces on each side I get, kind of getting bounced around from from mom's house to dad's house and stuff like that and i remember those days i think i think i was an angry kid and, and i just i know i, I was <laughs> <laughs> i knew that the world was i knew the world was two things there was there was things that adults told you about the world and then there was the way the world actually was you know and i I think that that made me um, it made me, you know, I was already an angry kid, but the hypocrisy of the world, I think, sunk in on me at a really early age. And so I carried that in me. And I think by the time that I finally heard punk music and especially started playing in punk bands, you know, that was that was when I was like, oh, there's a whole community full of people who kind of who kind of realize the bullshit of the world and they're not huh. they're not necessarily interested in participating in said bullshit you know right so it just became 
and later on the grateful dead community became that to me on a, a completely different level but but uh it just seemed like like um these are the like-minded people you know but how i very first got into punk rock man i mean i think is like anybody my age it was Blink-182, Rancid, Offspring, Green Day. That You know, that's what was on the radio, Nirvana. Um, and then it was like, you know, when you listen to a band like Rancid, then you, you find out, oh, r- these guys have their own record label. And then you get like a Give Them the Boot compilation and you find, you know, or, or with no effects, it's like, <clears throat> oh, they're signed to this label called Epitaph. And then you, you get a, a Punkarama CD. Right. And, you, you know, and then and then also too when we were coming up, I mean, say what you want to say about it, but Warp Tour was was unbe- oh. unbelievable for small bands. Um I saw I, I saw bands that would play when we were talking about Rise Against earlier. I would see bands that would literally play on the blacktop in front of 20 kids. Then three years later they're on the main stage. And you know, you know what I mean? It's like um uh, it, it, it was uh, those first, you know, those first several years of Warp Tour. I, I thought were were really. It kind of got away you know, from itself in the right. later era, but but um, but yeah, I think it was just the the perfect storm. If you were kind of an angry or disaffected kid, um, you know, with 1994 with Nirvana breaking, when Nirvana broke, it just it just opened the floodgates for all sorts of music to be in the mainstream. And then if, if you liked it enough, you could dig deeper and get into the underground. Yeah. Right. So I think we had pretty similar, similar experiences. I think I'm going to, and it's funny you mentioned the war tour cause all week I've been trying to figure out what, uh, what the next topic for Rob and I to do on the, on the show. Cause we, tr- we kind of go week by week. We don't have like a month plan. We just kind of every week go, Hey, what do you think about this? And we just go with that. And I was going to ask him if he wanted to do like either the golden age of or what was the best warp tour. And I I did a 2005. I did uh, back when I was very heavy into political activism. Um, I was a part of a group called the World Can't Wait, and we we had a booth um, for the whole 2005 warp tour minus um, Canada. That's crazy. Yeah, so I got to see I got to see No Effects play probably forty times that summer, and I got to see Dude, I got to see um, against me um, when they had the original lineup probably thirty or forty times. Wow, uh, that's and, crazy. Yeah. Dude, I, one quick story since you're a No Effects fan, are you a? Oh no! Ah! This is gonna be the most interesting podcast to watch and listen to. If anybody's listening to it, it's frozen again. There you are. (laughs) Okay. So, what is the question about no effects? Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so one of my favorite albums by them ever was The Decline. Are, Are you a fan of that album? Oh man, I have a love hate relationship with that album. I don't think it's a song. I think it's an album. It's an EP. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's it's. I mean, it's all right. It's good. It's it, like objectively, it's like fantastic. Yeah, but it's it's just not really my cup of tea. But I yeah. do respect it, and I have listened to it many times. Uh, boy, yeah, the decline. I'm not going to get myself in any trouble here. <laughs> it's it's it's. But I mean, like I, I like it, and it's of the era of my favorite no effects stuff anyway. So like in that aspect, it's really really good. I just. It's exhausting, man. Like, listen, that shit is exhausting. Well, I, I think since I've got like a little, you know, hippie streak, it was kind of like, it was kind of like Dark Side of the Moon or something. It was like a full, it's a full, I feel like the decline's a full piece, you know, it's obviously like a concept, a heavy yeah. concept, you know. Anyways, I take this to say, uh, the, the decline's my favorite no effects uh, okay. album. And, uh, Man, we so when we did our booth at Warp Tour, we had to do it all day long so we couldn't see any music. Um, but consistently at the end of the day, um, against me and no effects, I could always see them because they were they were some of the last bands to play. So we'd break down our table early and go catch no effects. Well, this one day I'm in um, I think I'm in Dallas, Texas, and it is 
fucking brutally hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, Welcome to Texas. <laughs> um, by the, you know, we, we get through this day, you know, and, and, uh, by the time we get everything broken down, I'm ready to go see no effects. And it starts just downpouring rain, like, like bad, um, lightning. And it's just like, okay, this, you know, the, the, the gig's going to be canceled this, you know, this sucks. And, um, so we, but we go over to the stage area anyways, and the kids won't leave and they're chanting, no effects, no effects, no effects. And me and my buddy, uh, kind of took cover by this like semi. So we weren't getting rained on. Okay. Uh, fat Mike comes on stage and says, um, they told us for safety reasons, we, we can't perform, um, but th- but they said if we wanted to we can come out and do one song since you guys won't leave if you guys if you guys promise to leave after one song we'll play one song for you and then um, that, the hi hat intro to the, the the decline came out dude and it was like as like a, I think I was nineteen or twenty years old at the time as like a twenty year old punk rock dude like holy fuck I'm gonna get to watch them play the the decline you know uh, it was awesome they played the whole thing and. Probably my favorite memory from from that year's warp tour, you know. Well, I can tell you that even with my lukewarm response to that question, that if I was in that situation, I would have lost my mind. <laughs> yeah, it was that's, awesome. No, because that's <laughs> badass. I have a no effects warp tour story too. Oh, I yeah. was at the I was at the Houston uh warp tour in nineteen ninety eight. That's how old I am, folks. Uh <laughs> when no effects got on stage, didn't like the like natural reverb that was going on. It made it sound really bad. And so they threw a bunch of money out into the crowd and I got like 36 bucks. So they, what, threw they all just their... left? They just left? No, 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 no. They played, were pissed off how bad it sounded ah. and said, we're not going to take y'all's money and threw a bunch of money in the crowd. Now I've talked to Mike in person about this and he claims that they got paid double what they threw out in the crowd, but they've always said that they threw all their money out in the crowd. I don't know <laughs> what, I don't know what's true and what's not, but I know they threw a bunch of money on the crowd. They threw enough out for, uh, dude, all of the people in the front got money, bro. I got like $36, dude, and it was in mostly ones. So so kind of similar story when No Effects, uh, that same summer when No Effects played Florida, they, I don't know if they still do, but they had obscenity laws at the time where you weren't allowed to curse on stage. <laughs> and if you cursed, you in would- In Florida of all places? Yeah, if you cursed, you would uh, get get some kind of fine, like like 150 bucks or something. So Fat Mike came on stage and he said that they were playing for free that night so they could uh, curse. And then it was just the most profanity laden, um, no effect show. Not that it's not already, but uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, that was awesome. It that was sounds like cool. a no effects thing. Um, yeah, I think I will talk to Rob about doing a, a warp tour episode because I would love to relive '98 and just talk about the lineups that my favorite versus the lineup and his favorite. Because yeah. dude. The Warp Tour all the way up to like probably 05, 06 was like the gold standard of like what you could accomplish in a summer like touring circus, you know, like. Oh, yeah. That was it. I still think it's yet to be defeated. Like the, the as we were young or when we were young thing is like the Warp Tour could it, it wishes it was the Warp Tour. It's 25 times the cost and nowhere near the actual quality. Bro, bro, what we got to see for $25, like that's what I'm saying, like or 40 bucks. Dude. At one year, I saw uh, all the punk bands I wanted to see, and I got to see the Deftones and Eminem, and it was twenty five dollars, dude. Like, what are we doing, dude? Like, I forgot was, Eminem was on the Warp tour. Yeah, he played with a overalls and a Jason mask, and he had a bunch of mummies walking around on stage, and he was playing. Uh, he played all the stuff off the first uh, LP. That's amazing. I remember yeah. one one year I got to see AFI, No Effects. Rancid, Bad Religion, um, I think Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, and then the a uh, couple guys from the Misfits and a couple guys from the Ramones were doing like a group of 1950s covers, and um, just on and on and on. Oh, uh, Mighty Mighty Boss Toads, Green Day oh, yeah. was on that year. It was like, <coughs> um, and then all the small bands that I got to see um, that I wouldn't have seen anywhere else, you know. Right. And, and yeah, like you said, the when we were young thing, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, you, you would have to be so much fucking money and they're not coming to your town. You got to make a flight, you know, you got to get a hotel yeah. and it's just, that's, that's the thing, man. 
it's not worth it, you know. Well, Rob, my buddy Rob, who does the show with me, he he went, and that's where we got to meet in person. So I have like a, I have like this memory of Las Vegas of meeting somebody who's a dear friend of mine now, and it you can't put money on that. I would spend For sure. however much money I have to spend to do something like that with him again. And I wasn't going to the fest. He was. I just happened to be going to Vegas to go to the Punk Rock Museum, and we it overlapped by two days, so we got to go hang out in person and do like an in person impromptu podcast. It was awesome, bro. It was like the coolest shit. We went gambling. We went and had dinner. It was freaking awesome, dude. It was so much fun. How was that? Uh, how was that museum, bro? <laughs> you can't. There's no value that you can place on what's in that building with yeah. money. Yeah. It doesn't exist. If somebody said it's $300 to get in there and go look around, I would say go. It's yeah. not, it's like 20 bucks or something like that. Right. But it, I mean, it might be 40. I don't remember what it was. It's not cheap, Yeah. but the stuff that they've got in there and the amount of stuff that they're able to do with that place, it is the most DIY bro. I got to go hold Tim Armstrong's guitar, bro. Like, what are we talking about, dude? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Like, yeah. I mean, I literally like got emotional. I was like holding it. Like, oh, fucking, oh. Like, <laughs> I thought that was you know. when I, I was keeping up when they were construction. Oh, a punk museum and this and that. But if, but if you're going to do it, dude, being able to hold the instruments, you know, not having them. Jimi Hendrix guitar is behind fucking glass, bro. You're not well, touching that thing, but. And but you you can touch Tim Armstrong's guitar, man, and it's like that's probably the Jimi Hendrix of punk rock, you know. Uh, you like, know what I'm saying, dude? He's probably the greatest <laughs> punk rock songwriter of all time. Yeah. And and there's a lot of stuff that is behind glass. Like his op ivy stuff is behind glass. But like the pink guitar says fuck up on it. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's early rancid stuff, dude. That yeah. might even have been around during op ivy. That's the one that I got to hold and fool around with and strum on and stuff. So I can feel the energy with that guitar, man. It's real, dude. That that is a real thing. Yeah. But uh, you know, I I I just met Fat Mike in that place, just walking around. I got, I took a couple of tours. It was awesome, man. I filmed it, dude. If you go on my channel and look, you can find a ton of stuff from that from that vacation trip, uh, that my That's wife and I took. Cool. And that was my first time leaving Texas. What for real? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit, bro! I was poor growing up, dude. I had no money to go anywhere. And yeah, I'm, you know, I got a family now, so. That tells you how important that place was to me and my wife that when we decided to go on our first trip, she wanted me to be able to go there and see that guitar. That's what she wanted. Like That's my cool. wife is my best friend in this world, dude. We yeah. have our problems. Everybody does. I would do anything for her, bro. If she wanted me to stop this channel today and go get a regular ass job so I can give more money to the family, I would do it. Sure. Yeah. Fortunately, I make decent enough money to where I don't have to do that because I, I, I bartend two, a couple days a week. But yeah, you know, it's, it's not stable i guess is the right word it's not very stable i wanted to show you something before we get out of here man sure so we're talking about early punk albums and stuff right that got us into the genre yeah i don't do a lot of like birthday gifts and stuff it's just not really i mean i'm 42 right i got two things out. oh wait you were on the stream last night weren't you uh, yeah i showed up I, I could only hang for a minute but i saw you and your son okay did you see the record that i pulled out I so well you were playing a record and I okay. asked how, how you didn't get booted. Okay, hold hold on, dude. Hold on. He's getting a record, folks. Stay stay here. All right. So no, I'm in my office. Everything's close. Uh so okay. I I got myself two things because I just couldn't help myself. But are you a fan of the Murder City Devils? I've never listened to him, to be honest. Oh, yeah. buddy. I, I might have opened up a can of worms. Uh, well, this is a first press of this record, and it is incredibly rare. And I have never seen one in person until I was in Austin yesterday. Nice. So I picked that up. But in 96, I one of the first punk albums I ever bought in my whole life was I got in it, it, I can't tell which one. I don't know which one was first. But in the course of like a few months, I picked up Life in General by MXPX. No effects. I heard they suck live. Rancid and out come the wolves. And I bought the Suicide Machines. Destruction by definition, based solely on the fact that they had a song called the Van Song. Yeah. And I had them all on cassette tape. And I've never, ha I haven't had those in years and years and years. I've replaced the Rancid cassette tape 
I've got the no effects one, and I just acquired the suicide machines one. That and record, that suicide machines record right there was played played on repeat with the band that I had in when I was sixteen. All of our all of our buddies. I mean, and the other bands that you mentioned too, but specifically that suicides machine. It seemed a bit more underground because they weren't on. They weren't that's, on MTV like the other bands, you know. That's what I liked about it when I was a kid, man. And yeah. this tape is in phenomenal condition, bro. I, I'm not gonna tell you what I spent on it because it's way too much. <laughs> but but as a record store owner, you probably know probably what about this thing cost. Sure. And, yeah, and yeah. it I can't tell you how excited I am to own this, man. Like I just I've also got dude, check this shit out. As a rancid fan, even a little bit, you'll appreciate this. Someday uh, when I someday when I make a little bit more money. I, I kind of want to collect tapes. I, but yeah, I, I love tapes. I, if you can't tell, I do a lot of tape stuff. I love yeah, tapes. Yeah. But uh, I've got the first one. Oh shit! Yeah, bro. Is that original? Yes. This is oh. this is like so. This is the first one that they did. Uh, this is like the second or third release, like like pressing of it, right? But it's a clear tape. No barcode. That's how you can tell the age of it. Well, this one is all black cover, white tape, actually the first pressing of this. So so you said earlier you didn't you were not a fan of the clash. So I wondered if you were a fan of Op Ivy or not. Oh, they're like, I mean, I consider them rancid, basically. They wrote the rule book for me. You know, when I was when I was getting into punk and I was kind of getting into like the philosophy of punk or whatever. Operation Ivy, their lyrics kind of one hundred percent. I've got a Unity tattoo on my chest from back in the day, and that's awesome. Know, yeah, yeah. Like, I just picked up a Fifteen record. Remember that band, Fifteen? Yes. Yeah. I picked up their record because my, my buddy that I was staying with, the guy from Generation Exit, he was like, "Dude, you should listen to this. If you like other stuff, then." I was like, I didn't like that when I was younger. I put it on Spotify, and like two songs in, I was like, "Shit, man, my, my I have flip flopped on this band. That, that is good stuff." <laughs> um, but I heard about Fifteen. Murder City Devils and Against Me all in the same like couple of months and uh from the same guy too. His name was Mike, oddly enough. Uh but um yeah, man. That the Suicide Machine stuff, they even had that little dancing guy that reminded me of Op Ivy a little bit. Like I used to Yeah. Like I was like, this is the closest thing we'll ever get to Op Ivy again. Them and like against all authority are like oh, the yeah. closest like offspring to Operation Ivy, in my personal opinion. Sure. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple other things that are out there. Link 80. Is pretty pretty op ivy, uh, man. God, so much music to listen to, man. So much stuff to listen to, but uh, yeah, dude. What are your? Uh, I got a couple of things. We'll, we'll get out of here unless you have time. Yeah, yeah, whatever, man. I'm good. But I like to make these long form conversations because they're way more interesting than me. Uh, what are your favorite bands? Like, if you had to pick a top five or so, or maybe top three or so. Like, what what are the ones that you're like when you're having that bad day and you just need some music? It doesn't have to be punk rock, dude. Just like, what do you gravitate towards? What is your stuff that you're like, your shit? Man, um, <laughs> if I'm being honest, um, you know that band, The Presidents of the United States of America? Dude, yes. <laughs> I was at work the other day and Love came on and nobody knew that song about me and I felt <laughs> old as fuck. Dude, so they have they have probably seven albums. And I, I feel like, you know, people after those first two albums, people really didn't pay attention to them. But they actually even put out an album probably five years ago. Wow. But, but when it comes to uh, feel-good music, dude, it's hard to listen to their albums and stay in a bad mood. You're not wrong, dude. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah you're, that's, that was the answer I... Wow, that was awesome. I like that. Um, <coughs> but uh, also, you know, the Beatles was, was drilled, okay. drilled into me as a small child. So, so the Beatles are there, but mostly what I do, like, um, what I'm doing right now, I'm going through a really big reggae phase. Yes. There's this artist, Chris Murray, Chris Murray, you might know him. He, he was on give him the boot volume five. It was one of the later okay. ones, but, uh, he also played with the slackers. Okay. Uh, okay. I like the slackers. The slackers, uh, were his backup band for one of his solo albums. But um, since I'm kind of doing the acoustic music right now, I, I've kind of been listening to similar artists. And okay. Chris, Chris Murray's a dude I can't get enough of. But um, what I tend to do, 
especially owning the record store is I'll get into a genre and then I'll, I'll just get lost in that genre until I find the best of the best. Nice. Um, during COVID lockdown, I was really into blues music okay. and uh, I really centered in on Chicago in the 1950s. Uh, but, you know, yeah, as one would. That's a th- good. Uh... Since this is a punk rock podcast, I, I've, I've figured out what I've found about myself, though, is that no matter what genre I get into, it like it has to be the people have to have true emotion. It has to be no bullshit. And the recording quality has to be somewhat shitty. And it's, it seems like <laughs> it seems like no matter what genre I go to, that the punk rock side of me is still there where it's like, I don't want to listen to the polished BB King album from 1995. I want to listen to the shitty sound and BB King album. He wrote in 1955 in in a fucking club somewhere where everybody was drunk, you know, Um, that's you just, you just find this, you know, punk rock version of every genre. It's not hard to find. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's usually an aesthetic thing. You can find it pretty quick just by playing something for a minute or two, and then you can go, "Oh, this is the one. I'll take that." You dive into that album, and then you go, you know, further. I, so, I like that 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 way of describing that, though. That's 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 absolutely correct. That that Chris Murray guy I told you about. When you check his music out, he's got a um, an album called Raw, and okay. he recorded it on a walk band, just him and his acoustic guitar. And you would think, okay, maybe that's too lo-fi for me. Maybe that's too shitty of a sound. But then, but then you listen to it, man, and it's like, it's really, really good. You know, I would check that out. I, I yeah. wrote his name down too, so I'll be looking into his music. I like reggae a lot. But uh, what about you? What would you say? Is, you know, your top three or four, man, all time or like right now? Because it's definitely different. All yeah, time, give me, all give time, me a couple, time. give me a couple all yeah. time. Give me a couple right now. So all time is is rancid alkaline trio, um, one man army is number two actually. So rancid one man army, alkaline trio, born to lose from Austin, Texas, bro. If you don't know those guys, yeah, go listen to Born to Lose, and then maybe like uh, either Wisdom and Chains or the Gaslight Anthem, depending on if I want to punch somebody or cry. <laughs> and then, um, but like right now, right now I've been listening to. Let's see. What have I been listening to the most right now? Oh, a lot of like French dark wave stuff. Like there's a band called Kron and a band called uh, Syndrome 81 that I played on the show last night. I legitimately have been listening to them, to them a lot because Bullshit Detector has a similar sound. And that's like one of my favorite new, like more modern bands. Uh, Liberty and Justice, conservative military image. Like everything they do is so good. If ACDC and Hanoi Rocks decided to start like a punk band, it would be conservative military image. Like, okay. It's, it's like rock and roll. And it's like, and it's like, it, it, it's kind of a bro shit too. It's like, pick up your, you know, get off the ground, quit being a little baby, get to work, and better yourself type music. So it's very sure. oi, very, very street punk. Yeah. Um, working class. Yeah. You're very working class. Uh, let's see. That's, that's, and then I, you know, also owning a record shop, I, I just get a lot of music. So I listen to a lot of stuff, but I'm about to dive into this today. It's a band. The guy that plays in the band came by my shop, and uh, we got to talking, and we knew a lot of the same people. So he wants me to review this on the show, and so I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to have him on the show to talk about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm doing. A, there's a band called Dylan Disaster and the Revelry. Uh, I I did like co. I don't know what to call it. I, I helped him put it out. Yeah. On on vinyl, and so I've been listening to that a lot. And then Generation Exit. Since I put this out, I've been listening to this a lot. It's very Social distortion, rancid, rock and roll, punk rock stuff. It's really, really good. Lots of guitar work. Uh, it's really nice. nice. But uh, yeah, a lot, lot of that rock and roll. My, my my tempo has slowed a little bit over the years. I don't listen to the unseen the way I used to. You know, <laughs> uh, I still like that band. I still like the Global Threat and the Virus and Street Punk is still like a, a very important genre to me. But like I've slowed down to more of the rock and roll stuff. I've been listening to Ramones a shitload for the podcast. Yeah. Oh, the Descendants and Circle Jerks. Never listened to them at all until I was older. So, oh, really? Uh, well, like, I guess that's kind of a fake statement because I listened to them enough to know I didn't care for it when I was younger. Yeah. Like, I just specifically the Descendants. I like the Circle Jerks. I just didn't dive into them really. I had a couple of their albums and they just kind of were in like rotation a little bit. The Descendants, however, 
I didn't like. I don't know what it was about it. I didn't like. I just didn't like it. Yeah. And then as a 42 year old, I've got an autistic son who reminds me a lot of Milo. And now the lyrics are more important to me. And oh shit! Now we're back. So there. Yep, okay. Yep. Uh, phone call. No, no, I don't know what no. happened. Anyways, uh, so like. I connect to the, with them on a different level. And I did all that research because I'm going to that show on the 19th where it's the descendants, the adolescents and the circle jerks. And so I, I wanted to talk about them and, and dive into the music a little bit, because if there's anything that I am not, it is not, I am not a poser because if I, if you, if you're, if you're, well, cause like by definition, I would have to be like, yeah, I'm a big fan of the descendants. And then you'd have to find out and go, Oh shit. He doesn't really like that band that much. I've never claimed to like a band that I didn't like, whether it was cool or not. It didn't matter yeah. to me. It is what it is. Cause I, I fear nothing more than being like found out as a fraud. So like, I don't, <laughs> I don't well, I don't, so I don't behave that way. Like yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't act like I like something that I don't like. I don't like, I listen to a lot of oi music. I'm not a skinhead. I'm just not, I, I'm, I'm a punk rocker. So yeah. like, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put out there an image or, or, or a statement of something that's false because I feel like that's where the real, quote unquote poser shit really happens is you just faking it, bro. Like don't you don't gotta be cool. Like I'm not cool. I never have been. And so, you know, diving back into these older bands, when I was young, I didn't like the recording quality a lot of some of it. Like the old misfit stuff, old circle jerks. That was my issue with that stuff was the recording quality. As an adult, really? I like the recording quality now. So yeah, it's weird, so man. It's very that, weird. That's where that's where we differ, man, because like when I heard all the um you know the radio more radio friendly punk stuff. I, I really liked it. I did, but dude, the second that I found, and I think it's because <laughs> I think it's because I was raised on like, you know, the Beatles and stuff that was recorded on tape. Right. But the second I found specifically the misfits, um, and then black flag, um, that's, I've always gravitated towards like lower fidelity recordings um, ever since I heard those two bands. Well, I don't know what changed in, in for me, Yeah, but about three years ago, like post COVID dude, like, or since COVID, <coughs> I discovered a bunch of bands that had only put out one or two EPs on cassette or something. Right. Yeah. And so I bought those because I liked the music and I heard like a digital version of it. And when I got the tape, it was much more lo-fi. And so I just developed this taste for that kind of music. And so when I went yeah. back and we did like our Misfits episodes on the on the show, I went back and listened to it and was like, oh, man, I really do enjoy this now. I don't think I gave it a proper chance when I was younger. I had so much to choose from that I was like, oh, no, don't like this. On to the next. And I never went back to it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, with the Descendants and the Misfits specifically, that happened. With Circle Jerks, I liked them enough to keep their stuff because their music was just faster. Um, Black Flag, I never really got into. Still don't really care about much. Um, they've got some songs that I enjoy, but uh, never understood the, the the thing about Black Flag. Like, But I liked the – I was – I'll be honest, dude. When I was young, young, like 16, 17, 18 – I was more into the attitude and the image or not more into, but as much as I was the music, like it was this, my shirt that I was wearing and my hair being up was just as important as what was in my record collection. And yeah. that changed, that changed pretty early. I'd say like early twenties, like 21, 22, 23. I even quit having like the Mohawk and shit, but like until I made like a concerted effort to like not give a shit about my, my clothing and stuff, I still dress pretty much the same right now as I did even back then, but like I don't have the same like desire to make it like I just put on patches because it's bands I want to represent. I like them yeah. versus I want to look a certain way. Like I don't really give a shit about that. I haven't for most of my life at this point, but for a long time I was very concerned about that because I wasn't very I was very uh, you know I was I was uh, self conscious man. I didn't have very much. I, I even within my own group of friends I wasn't cool, you know. So. I, I had a lot of uh, anxiety about that stuff, so I wanted to make sure that I fit in, even with this outcast. It's such a weird thing to even say out loud. I've never really talked about it, but that's really no. What it I is, mean, you know? I mean, that's your social group, so yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I I definitely had my mohawk, my mohawks. Um, but if you can see, like, it was more just oh. that it was more just that my hairline, my hairline naturally makes a mohawk. <laughs> that's awesome. 
and I liked punk music anyways. So it was like, I think it was really less about like, uh, it was just like, Hey, this fits, you know, mine was a, <laughs> my, mine was a, uh, a, a conscious decision to make a statement. Yeah. I want, I wanted people to either talk to me about what I was doing because I looked a certain way or leave me the fuck alone because of how I looked. Right. And, and it worked because I was, I live in Houston, man. And back in the nineties, that shit was not tolerated, bro. Like I, yeah. Like I, I distinctly remember being about 10 years old and I was at Walmart with my mom and there was a, a guy standing in line in front of us and we were getting a couple of things and he had on bondage pants and he had a blue mohawk and he had on, I think a leather jacket with some patches and spikes and a couple of tattoos. Right. And I remember looking and going, I want to be that guy when I'm, you know, <laughs> and my mom was like, Oh sure. Whatever. Stop. You know, yeah, yeah. you fast forward like maybe five years and I was that guy <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, I was skateboarding and I was getting into trouble and I was, but it was like a, the trouble thing was not, had nothing to do with punk. It was because I was just a troubled kid and I didn't have my dad around to, to you know, it was just a, I was just a little shit, you know, and I needed somebody to talk to me and nobody was there, you know? So yeah. I, uh, I developed this real bad attitude and, I, and I'm not good at learning the way that most people are. I have extremely bad ADHD and very bad memory problems. And so my <laughs> learning, well, no, like it's legitimate. Like I have like head injuries and shit. So like yeah. my memory is a real problem. And like, so even as young as ninth grade, I remember being like, I can't read this and remember it in 10 minutes. Like, no. so studying is not going to work for me. I, I do things with hands-on experience. And so, you know, I, I, yeah, dude, it was my life was rough as a kid because I was such I was an outcast everywhere, dude. I was an outcast at home. I was an outcast at school. I was an outcast with my own friends. I, you know, I went. My mom forced me to go to church all the time, so I was definitely an outcast there. And like, and look, dude, my mom's doing the best she could. Yeah, yeah. The church. Yeah, she still goes to that same church, and my kids go with her. I don't make them go; they choose to go. Like I don't. Sure. Yeah. They don't. They can do what they want. They choose to go. My son's real bright. He's learning. He wants to read the Bible and learn a bunch. He wants to learn everything he can learn, like just in general. Like yeah. he's just a smart kid. And so, you know, they do what they want to do. And and like, and I think my mom understands now that, hey, you know, maybe if I hadn't have shoved this on your throat so hard, maybe you'd be still going here with me. <laughs> and, and honestly, that's that's honestly likely the case. You know, I might still be going to church if I wasn't forced to go. And but I mean, I find my least favorite thing in the entire world, if you can't tell by now is hypocrisy man and that goes with even being like oh i like the misfits when you don't really like stop right. with that bullshit yeah that yeah. goes all the way into live this way and then hey man do as i say don't do as i do no right. no 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 bro yeah. the best thing you can do in this entire planet on any front on any level with any person is lead by example and that means if you're a preacher a teacher a father a kid a friend an associate at work whatever that is do what you want people to do and ain't nobody be able to tell you otherwise now. If you well, behave the way you're supposed to behave and whatever that means, then nobody can say shit to you. Because when you get found out, you know, when you get found out, then everything that you've said becomes null and void. Facts. You know, it's just um, none of it matters if, if you're not applying the same principles that you're, you're preaching, so to speak. You know? 100%, man. I got into a thing at work the other day. I told you I bartend part time. Uh, it is it is part time. It's like two three days a week. Most most is three days. You know, it's I, my shop's open on the weekends, so I have that, and then I have like two days a week bartending, and then I have three days a week where I focus on the channel, right? And uh, I was at work, and we had a movie, and I'm not going to go into the movie. I'm not going to go into the people that were there, but it was a specific demographic of people that were at this movie, and unfortunately, it was kind of expected that there might be some kind of uh outbursts and things right and so uh a, a group of people come in and we have a rule at our theater where like you can't be more than 15 minutes late we'll just give you a refund or give you a different ticket for a different movie but we're not gonna let you sit in that movie if you're late it just interrupts everybody it's rude yeah and so these people were 30 freaking minutes late dude 30 minutes and so I'm like, I'm like, why would you even want to watch a movie that you're half hour late? To? Right. Yeah. And so, but I'm telling them like our rules and I'm closing. It's late, dude. Like we're the last movie's already started. We're, but I'm talking to them and I'm like, Hey, you know, I can't let you in, but I can give you a refund or I can give you another ticket, whatever you want. Just let me know. I'm, we're not here to take your money, but this is our, 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 our rule. And I'm like sweeping the floor, you know, and 
she's really upset. And I could tell she's really upset. And then all of a sudden, she accuses me of being racist. And yeah. was like, well, you're not you're not letting me in because I'm a black woman. And I was like, huh? Well, hold on. What is going on right now? <laughs> yeah. Dude. And I, I, I got really offended. Like, I don't get offended very often. I can't remember the last time that I was actually offended. But I was so upset, dude. And I just matched her energy. And I, I still have to go back to work. I haven't been back to work since that night. So <laughs> I'm expecting a talking to when I go in tomorrow. But, like, I was so pissed off. And I... Because I because I do lead by example. Like I'm not perfect by any stretch of the word, man. Like, yeah, I'm just like. But I, I would say that I'm a good father, and I would say that you can count on me. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And if I tell you I'm this kind of person, then I'm this kind of person. So I do take it seriously. My reputation is all I've got, and so. Well, that's a heavy yeah. accusation. That's a heavy accusation Whoa. to put on somebody. I I don't want somebody putting that accusation on me. You know that that sucks. You know. Well, it hurt my feelings a little bit because I was like, man, if you only knew the. The 10 people that came in before you got here were all regular customers of mine, all in the same demographic, and all of them I consider my friend. Yeah. And yeah. and I and none of them would they, if they were out here, they would be like, Would you stop, lady? That was gross. <laughs> I know him. And and but I didn't. I had that. All I had was me standing there by myself. And I was like, I cannot believe this is happening to me right now. Yeah. And dude, and I just got like I I got upset. I was like to the point of like shaking. I was so upset. I was like, why are you saying this to me? Like, what did I do to you? You were the one that was late, not me. I didn't do anything. You did it. it has nothing to do with who you are. I'll tell you it, what's. I'll tell you what's almost even worse is. So I live in in Indiana, small town. I'll have people come into my record shop and say uh, a racial slur to me that I've never I've never met this person, but. You know, they'll, they'll say something to me. And if I'm being honest, most of the time I'm just, I just frozen and I don't know what to do in that situation. So I don't, unfortunately I don't address it. I probably should. But then when they leave, I'm like, what made that person feel so comfortable that they could say that in front of me? And I've never even met that person. You know, that, that fucks me up almost even worse. You know, it's like, what kind of energy am I putting out there that makes you think this is well, okay? I, I would venture to say you're not putting out any energy. This that it's this their ignorance, man. Because yeah. I've actually got the exact same story, but I live in Magnolia, where I'm outside of Houston by about 30, 40 minutes, and so like I'm kind of in the sticks out here, bro. We got like one little grocery store. There's not a lot of places to eat out here. There's like maybe six or seven places that you can go within a few miles. And then you have to travel into it up Tomball, Texas to go. And that's a small town. So then, yeah. so like, so like, uh, when I moved into this place, we came out here simply because it was more affordable. Right. I have to drive almost an hour to get to work, dude. It's a long way to get to my job. Right. And so we were, we've only been here a little while and I was outside talking to our neighbor. I didn't know them yet. So I go over there and I introduce myself and, uh, it's like a 20 year old girl. And then I find out, Oh, she's living here and her folks are in town. I thought they all lived there. And so I, her dad comes outside and he's talking to me and he does that right in my face. And I, I had the exact same feeling. What am I That's your neighbor. doing? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I come inside, I slam my door. And I'm like really <laughs> upset. My wife's like, what happened? And I tell her and she's like, wait, he said it to you. Like why? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. But like, not that this gives me any kind of like credibility, but like my nephew and niece are half black. Sure. So I take it, I take it like, like many times more personal than I think maybe I should even, but oh, I, yeah. I hate those words. Like I, they're just so you don't need them. We just don't need them. Like it's unnecessary. So well, it's it really, just, it's, I, it's it really weird. Me. It's weird, especially like as a business owner and just as a person in general, I, I hope that like next time it happens, I don't get deer in the headlights and I'm like, Hey man, don't say that shit don't come in here saying that shit, you know, but the, the couple times it's happened, it's just like, I, I, I just end up feeling bad. Like what, what made you think that that would like, what vibes am I putting off where I, it's like, that's okay. You know? I literally, like, I, no, I literally had that exact same thought. It was a personal thing where I was like upset by like, what am I doing wrong? But we're not doing anything wrong, man. And I think that, 
since yeah. you brought that up on this podcast, that next time that happens, I think you will have the courage to tell the dude to fuck off because <laughs> right. I, well, hey, I have I have I have declined to sell records to two people in the four years that I've had my place. And both of them were because of that. Yeah. I was like, sorry, dude, I don't I don't associate with people that talk like that. And they were like, what's it got yeah. to do with selling records? And I was like, well, everything to me, because this is my place. And if you think you can come here and talk like that, I wasn't trying to be well, a then dick. He's, I was just he's gonna he's gonna bring all his friends that talk like that. Thank and, you. you know, Adler does not guys, have their business. I don't need their business, I don't need their money. If I need it bad enough, I'll just sell my records online. You know, right? It's just not worth it. <laughs> It's just not worth it, man. The last thing I need is that kind of shit in my place where I conduct business. I have people, I have families in there. I have people yeah. of all shapes, kinds, and colors. And uh, yeah, it's very, uh, it is my sanctuary. That is my place to be myself. And you don't get to come in there and ruin that. I don't give a shit. You don't, you're not entitled to that. Yeah. Dude, entitlement is the worst thing that these people have going for them. And I, don't, and I mean, I mean, these people by like, just like jerk people in general, like that sure. lady at the theater. She's like, well, I already bought my ticket. And I'm like, well, that doesn't mean that you're entitled to see this movie. Yeah. You're entitled to be here on time and see this movie. Yeah. Once you val violate that rule, you don't get to do what you think you get to do now. And you don't, we don't owe you anything. And yeah. I don't owe any kind of racist prick, you know, my time <laughs> yeah. or business. You know, I don't owe, I don't owe you that shit. It yeah. makes me, so, my dad was kind of like that. So I have like a, I really hate that shit, man. And I think yeah. I overcorrected maybe because my dad was like that. And I, and I'm, and I, I, my, my older brothers are kind of like that. And I, I overcorrected. I don't even talk to those guys. I haven't talked to them in 22 years. Like I don't. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's definitely, especially when you, you know, I, I don't know. Texas is probably similar, but, but Indiana, it's like, if you don't, I feel like if you don't kind of put, draw a line in the sand, then, then it, you know, the, the, they're everywhere. I mean, this is this is Trump. This is like Trump Nation out here. Yep. So like, if you don't kind of draw a line in the sand and say, "Hey, I I'm not with your shit," you know, right? You can easily get um, you can easily get a lot of that in your life, I guess. You know. Well, no, you'll get lumped into that just because you didn't speak up. I mean, I was at a yeah. gas station on a on a on that vacation. I took to Vegas. And we went. To, we drove out to the Grand Canyon. And it takes like a, a couple of hours to get there. And so we stopped to get something to eat and some and some gas in the car or whatever. And they had this big Trump, this whole section of the store, dude. It was like figurines, a big <laughs> Trump, a Trump genie thing that you could like take pictures with and shit. And I'm over there taking pictures, but I'm laughing. I'm like laughing right, about it. Yeah. And this lady got like offended. She's like, what's so funny? I'm like, you don't find this fucking ridiculous. I'm like, you don't see this is crazy to you. Yeah. Like you don't see that shit with Biden anywhere, and I'm not like I'm not pro either side. I, sure, sure. But like that's crazy. That yeah, it, dude. It's living in Katy, Texas, bro. Just Google that shit. It'll probably have his face somewhere on there. Like, <laughs> dude, you you would see like these big ass trucks drive by with these Trump flags, dude. Trump 2024. They will cut that's, you off if you if you have like punk rock stickers on your car, bro. You're a target, man. You, it's that, wild, dude. That's that's our city, dude. We we have um, so our our city is very religious, right? And and again, I'm not trying to get on politics, but it's just it's a crazy thing. It's um, very religious city, but we have four people in town who fly these flags that say <laughs> that say fuck <laughs> fuck Biden, you know, and so. Like, I'm not even opposed to that comment, but, like, you're going to fight no. the flag. But, but you know, um, they've been asked to take them down by the city because of uh, the obscenity and children and this and that. And uh, three of the people took down their signs when they were asked. And the one guy, he sued the city for freedom of speech because it's, it's, um, it's political free speech. And he won. And he's able to fly his, his fuck Biden sign. But that's you well, know. That's, how do you feel about that, though? How do how do you feel about that? Because I am I am a man of principle, and I stand on freedom of speech. Because if you take that from us, it will affect us as much as it will anybody else. I so, I'm a hundred percent with you. But here's here's my argument, though. You're so you're for the Republican Party. You're for for not Donald me personally. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is this guy flying. Oh, okay, I was like, no, no, no. Let's not yeah. get that. Yeah, definitely not so, me. So this guy's flying a, a flag that says "fuck Biden" on it, and uh, you know you would assume because he's he's a Republican, 
He's a conservative. So isn't that isn't that party stand for family values? Well, no, because and they're you, all a bunch of hypocrites. And you've but, got this you've got this giant flag that kids walking down the street, it just, it says fuck on it. That's not, you know. Well, okay, okay. So I've got kids and I am fairly religious, but I also know that my kids go to public schools where they're going to hear this stuff anyways. Yeah. You can't you can't shelter little kids from that, man. Like sure. Like here's the thing. I I stand for freedom of speech because I think we need to show these people the consequences of their actions. You want free speech? Well, that comes at a cost. Yeah. Everything comes at a cost. And if you're going to talk like that, and if you're going to say the N-word around people, you're free to say it. I support yeah. the right to say what you want. I would love to know that you're that kind of person because then fuck you. And I don't exactly. want to talk to you. So it's it, it's, it's, a, it's a weird balancing act. You have to be able to like be willing to say you should be able to say that so that I can now identify you as a creep and not be around you. So there's it's weird, man. There's it's zero, weird. there's zero argument there. I agree with everything yeah. you said. My, I guess my only thing is, is that, it, you know, if supposedly you're about the party that's about family values, then like, why is it so important to you to fly this thing with the F word on it? You know, well, I just, it's, not, it's not about that. It's not about family values. It's not about the Republican party. It's about, Fuck Joe Biden. That's what it's about. Right. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's not about fixing anything. It's not about that. It never has been since yeah. the, probably the third or fourth president, bro. I, <laughs> I, would say, I, would say, I can say with absolute certainty since the 70s, it hasn't been about that. But I would say sure. before that even, it's, 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 it's about screw the other team. It's about, it it's is about, about money. It's about money. It's about division. Dude, yeah. it was about fixing stuff. They would fix our jails first. They would fix our homeless se second. Like, yep. dude, I, I don't have this. I'm not the kind of person that thinks that every homeless person is absolved of any kind of wrongdoing. And they should all be treated like queens. And, no, 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 no. But I do think there's a lot of people that could use some help. And you, you're never going to find out if you don't start talking to them. And, you know, it's you should definitely men mental health. Yeah, a lot of mental health. And a lot of that stuff can't be helped at all. And a lot of those people are going to go back to doing that stuff. So, you, But you have to at least try. You have to at least try. Yeah. And, but they don't mm -hmm. want to try. They don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. They don't want to find out because out of every group of 10, there's going to be at least one person that's going to make a change if you give them the tools to do so. So well, you have, you have, you know, you've proven in your life that right, you went right. from, from 25, you know, narcos in one day to, to zero. You, it's, yeah. It, it's it's an owner. hundred percent possible. You know, so, so I do know that. So I, but I also, I also understand that people don't necessarily need a handout. They need help. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a weird thing where like the younger punk generation is all about like they're, you know, I think we all do that. We all start at this, like almost like communist type of thing where everybody should get an equal share of everything. And then, and then, you know, and, but as you get older, you realize that no, because if you do that, there's going to be people that don't want to do anything and they're going to want an equal <laughs> share of everything. And I yeah. don't personally want to work to just give you, stuff and maybe that's me being an old commercial asshole i don't know but i yeah. look at it different than i used to look at it and i think that that happens with most people but like but there is if i had 10 million dollars i can tell you by the day after i would only have three because i don't need right. 10 million dollars i don't yeah. need it i don't want it i don't need it i'll take a couple and fix my family and set everybody up that i love and then after that let's go fix some my community let's start you, in my community and let's go outwards you know the the same money that we spend creating bombs we could spend developing our communities. Money, oh, okay, okay. Money's yeah. money's not money's not a bad thing. It's right, it's, right. It's the choices that you make with money. Well, the, you know? well, when we make bombs, we kind of have to because if we don't, other countries will, and they will just take us over. And I'm sorry, but that's not a that's not a, a good answer. That's not a good answer to the situation. But there is lots of money being delegated to places and things and and, and whatever that that could be given to helping people out and then yeah portions of the bomb money could be going to help better causes and so like it's again it's a big gray area there is no yeah. thing is like we don't need a military oh dude you were out of your mind <laughs> like, yeah we we have to have a military but i guess i guess my point is is we haven't been at you know every war since you know world war ii was the last war we fought where there was actually any kind of uh, eminent danger towards us, you know? Well, well, that's not true. That's not true. Because if we stopped doing the things that we did, it's unfortunate. We got ourselves in this situation. I'm not saying we didn't. Yeah. But I am saying that if we just suddenly stopped 
doing a bunch of the stuff and stop flexing muscles, we would become the target for a lot of world powers. And that's not oh, a good yeah. thing either. Yeah. So, and I'm not yeah. saying that it wasn't our, of our own wrongdoing. And I don't have the knowledge to go ahead and debate on the subject to a no. long, you know, yeah. to, to, a, to like some depth. But I do understand how it works. And we can't just stop. No, and no, you, in, you have to you in, have to protect yourself. I, I guess you have to protect yourself. These stupid ass things, though. We got yeah. people in places we don't need to be doing yeah. things we don't need to do. And but that's made us enemy number one to a lot of people. So now we're stuck doing these things. And yeah. like there are soldiers out there that are American soldiers that are like, let's go do it. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> stop doing this. Stop killing people like. Yeah, well, but it, it, at what cost? Because if we stop doing it, they're going to start killing us. So it's it's weird, man. I don't I don't have an answer. I, I don't. But yeah. I do know that 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 things aren't fixable. Really, they're we're, they're kind of in a place where we're going to have to get to a really dark place before we see some light. And we're not in the dark yet, man. People think we're in the yeah. dark. We're not in the dark yet, dude. We're headed for some real dark times. Like the world in general is headed for some darkness, man. And it sucks. It's scary. Let's just hope, let's just hope that, you know, let's just hope the aliens, uh, you know, there's been a, they've been really like, they've been really just kind of poking the alien issue lately. And, and with all the instability worldwide, um, you know, maybe, maybe if there are creatures out there watching us, maybe, maybe they're like, okay, it's time to fucking intervene because these guys are getting out of hand. You know, <laughs> you know that wouldn't even surprise me. But my, I said that to my mom, and she goes, "Yeah, honey, that's God." And I was like, "Ugh," I don't have a response to that. Like, how, what am I going to say? No, I don't know. I haven't died, so I don't know. But like, yeah, but like, yeah. I mean, at some point. But if that happens, my mom was like, "You don't want that happening." And I was like, "Okay, I see your point. Like, if you're going by that, you know, being the if that's reality, then yeah, I probably don't. But like, <laughs> you know, like the the world's in a in a in a bad place, man. It's." There's a lot of gross people out there. I mean, Donald Trump is a gross person. I honestly don't have a lot of positive, kind things to say about Joe Biden. No, me either. Yeah. yeah. But but I think that he's trying to do something that's, that he considers the right thing. I don't think that's what Donald Trump was trying to do. So, boy, I tell you, if that's our two candidates here in the next few months, I'm, I'm looking at being super depressed, man. I'm like, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know what to do. I Keep making music. Keep helping your local communities. Help your friends and family. Start at the bottom because you can't you can't clean up the top if the bottom's a mess. So so start at the bottom. Help yeah. your kids. Help your wives. Help your husbands and your friends. Then you help your neighborhoods. Then you help your communities. You help your 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 subculture. Your punk rockers. Your metalheads. Whatever it is, you help those guys. Then you start helping the homeless. Then you start helping the communities around you. Then you can go help your city. Then you can help your city. Help your state. It's yep. you have to start small. And it's a get, ripple effect. It is a ripple effect. And so. Uh, I go right back to uh, Punk with the Camera. I don't agree with everything that that guy does, but I have a massive amount of respect for that person oh, yeah. and what they're doing. I, I do. I genuinely do. I, I, I Sometimes I'm a little jealous because I'm like, I wish I had the time to go do some of that stuff. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that there's great things. I do think that there's a certain amount of, like, dude, chill. Like, go about it the right way, like, with certain things. With And that goes with everybody. But like, yeah, I have a lot of respect for that, that what they're doing, man. It, it's, it's nice to see some people that give a shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that what we all forget is that there is no group of us, be it two, four, six, or 12,000, where we're all the same. So even if it's just me and my best friend, we are very different people. Yeah. So you have to remember that. So when you go out to do these things, stop looking at all the things you have different and start looking yeah. at all the stuff you have in common. Look at the five or ten things you have in common and use that to strengthen your bond with your friends and family, and then you can start making some change. So I've got I've got a song that um, so I've got two EPs out right now that um, that you can listen to, but I've got a song coming out, a uh, two song single coming out April fifth, and there's I'm stoked. A, there's a song called Either Land on there. Um, it's like a reggae song, and yeah. um, that's exactly what the song is about. Uh, the lyrics that what you're just saying there, you know, we agree. Most of us, even like, even my Republican dad, me and my dad probably agree on 90% of things. Right. We get, we get, you know, we get lost in the weeds on this 10%. And I think sometimes what people forget and they need to remember is that 
you are being manipulated to, Ooh, buddy. To, yes. to fight over that 10%. Hmm. That that ten percent is a is a very profitable margin for a lot of people, and if if they can get, keep you busy fighting over the ten percent of things that you don't agree about, then they can do a whole bunch of shit behind your back and get away with mm-hmm. it. You know, Dude. and um, if you're stuck in this mindset that, you know, I'm of the mindset that every politician is bought and paid for by, by yes. some corporation. So it's like you, you kind of have to understand that, you know, the, the chorus of that song says the men that rule up top make money from the wars on either land. You know, it's 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 mm. the, it's the same cor- corporations that make the bombs, uh, you know, for either side of the war. They're going to make money <laughs> no matter no matter who you support. And 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 well, you you adding all this negative energy and making it a hot button topic on the internet <coughs> is only good for Facebook. It's only good for Twitter. Um, it only increases engagement on platforms that do not care about you and do 100%. not care, do not care about your struggles. They care about making money. And the more that you participate in all of this anger and all of this um, baiting each other, the more money they make. You know? Well, not only that, but the if if it was like that, but they were also participating in the war and they had something to risk. Okay, yeah. I still think it's disgusting, but dude, it's even worse because they sit up in these bomb shelters and count their money and have all their food and money and, and comforts and gold and women and while we're sending our twenty year olds out there to kill each other. It's and that's wild, dude. And that's the story that it's always been, you know. Probably it's going disgusting. back. Probably going back to the Civil War. I mean, I'm I'm sure it was the same back then too. You know. I, I yeah. I mean, I would imagine so. It's it's gnarly, man. Dude, <laughs> this has been an awesome, awesome conversation. I'm starving now, so I need to go get some yeah. food. But, bro, I would like to talk to you again one of these days if you have time, man. It's been a blast. Yeah, yeah, man. But, uh, um, I'll uh, I'll I'll send you um, like yeah. Maybe- how about as long as come out in April, we can talk uh, talk again. Okay, cool, awesome, man. Yeah. Good talking to you, dude. Before I let you go, I have two questions I ask every single person I talk to, and they're just fun questions. So it's I want to end it on a positive, fun, light note because sometimes we have heavy conversations like we did today. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I thought it was awesome though. I hope I hope people listen to the whole thing. I, I think most people will. Uh, okay. Question number one: If you could recommend any handful of bands to people right now, what would you recommend to people? Like maybe let's give me three to five. Anything you anything you got. Sure. Um, so for for reggae and ska, I've been listening to Chris Murray a lot, and I feel like he doesn't get enough attention. I definitely say Chris Murray. Um, if you're like a punk rock person, but you want to kind of like dip your toe in the blues, um, there's an artist called Magic Sam, and he's just real, real gritty 1950s blues from Chicago. So um, I would definitely say magic sam um this one's a selfish one but i've got a band called nervous burger that put out one album and then broke up and um if you like like the 90s punk sound um i think you'd like nervous burger and then um and then i'll also throw one out there for a lot of punk rock people if you haven't listened to uh hank williams senior i Mm. think i think um uh, you know they're two minute songs and they're usually you know they're they're very uh authentic music if, if you're a punk rock person and you want to get into country i would say listen to listen to hank uh hank senior and uh yeah so that would be that'd be my four recommendations do you like uh hank three i did i i liked uh i liked a couple of the albums um the novelty of what he does I'll be honest, kind of wore off on me kind of yeah. quick, but um, there's some great music in there and it's, it's awesome to see. He, he very easily could have just made millions of dollars uh, doing what the establishment wanted him to do. Right. But instead he, he went 
he he did what he wanted to do, and I'll always respect that. So. I saw him play once, and he did like a whole country set, and then an entire whole metal set. It was crazy. <laughs> it was it was dude. It was wild. But I have yeah. I just picked up a copy of Love Sick Broken Drifting because while the novelty did wear off with his later material, his early like first three records are perfection. Oh yeah. Okay, last question, and I'll get you out of here, man. This is my favorite one because I always I don't ever know what to expect from anybody. If you could tour with any band right now, you could just I gave you the financial stability to go on a four week tour with any band from any era. Who would it be and why? And you can say local bands, you know, huge acts, whatever, dude, doesn't matter. If you could, what's your what's your what's your idea of your dream tour? Man, um, it, it would it would one hundred percent be the Grateful Dead. Uh, Let's go. Yeah. Mm. Now, I mean, that would require uh, Jerry Garcia to still be alive, but uh, sure, sure, but. The um, it and the reason why I say that is I want to know, you know, I, I've been a fan for a long time and I've been a part of the community of deadheads on the outside, but I'm dying to know what the inside of that organization's like. I want to know, you know, are these guys because you don't want to talk about punk rock and anarchy and principles. Um, those guys were like at the forefront of the revolution of the 60s, and it'd be, I agree. It'd be interesting to me to see, are they just kind of rich yuppies who kind of just cashed in on the band or, or do they still hold those ideals? So it'd be, it'd be very interesting to tour with them. That's an amazing answer. I've yeah. always, I've always been of the mind that I don't like hippies. And then like, like maybe a year ago, I realized, wait a minute, we have a lot in common. <laughs> like uh, maybe I should oh, yeah. hate like, maybe I just don't like the music so much, but the people are fine. Like, like yeah. I'm not a big fan of like jam band stuff. Like I don't like the Grateful Dead. I don't dislike them. I don't have like a feeling on it. I just kind of like if it's on, cool, whatever. But sure. like I wouldn't choose. There's a lot of music that I don't want to hear. Like if it's on, I want to turn it off. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I don't have a problem with the stuff. I just don't choose to listen to it. It's uh, a lot. I do like, it's a lot ahead. like punk rock, where um, once you kind of get immersed in that community, the community is more important really than even the sure. music. You know. So. Well, this was given to me on my birthday a couple of years ago by my best friend. It's a first. Oh, first, nice. Yeah, first press. And this is like one of my favorite non-punk bands, like yeah. period. And so I'm about to go jam this out while I cook some food. But nice. uh, man, it has been a freaking pleasure and a half speaking with you, man. This was a long podcast and I, I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Well, dude, like sometimes you just get going and it's like, why do you want to? Like, why, why do we got to cap it? We can just talk to her ready to go grab something to eat or whatever. Like, I'm right. I, it's so much more fun this way. Um, your, your music's coming out in April, right? Or this yeah. new stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I've got two EPs out now. I'm going to do a two-song uh, single in April. And basically what my plan is, is all the way up to August when I go on tour with Harley Poe, I'm just going to put out music like probably once a month so I can stay in people's radar. And that's that's the furthest I've thought about it. I haven't really thought about anything. I mean, I'm sure someday I'll go play shows, but that's not even really something I'm messing with right now. Okay. Um, are you guys coming to Houston by any chance or Austin? I uh, actually, yes, we're we're uh, we're going to be playing at the Mohawk in Austin. I know that. Awesome. Well, I'll yeah. definitely make that show. Hopefully, you'll come. Oh, to that'd Houston. be awesome. No, no. If I can come in, come into the Mohawk. I, that was my first time going there. It was yesterday. That place was awesome. I'm about to put up some footage from that place. That's a great venue. Um, uh, check out. There's an artist called Sean James. Um, Sean, how do I spell Sean? Is it S H A W N or S E A N? Yep. You know that um, uh, recent zombie show? It's called like The Last of Us, or I think that's what it's called. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a he had a song on that show, so it kind of like elevated him. And, nice. and we're we're just gonna be uh, direct support. So we're gonna be oh cool. And we're gonna be playing like a 45 minute opening set. That's amazing, bro. I can't wait to come meet you in person and take some photos and yeah, hang out. Because if, if, as long as y'all don't mind, I usually film the sets and put them up on my channel. That's one of the things I like to do is oh, show people what I'm show people what I get to experience live. And I actually have more fun filming those sets and putting them up than I do like getting out in the mosh pit and stuff these days. Like I just really enjoy getting photos and video. Man, I, I love it, dude. It's so much fun. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> But all right, man. Well, give me all, send me all the links to everything, whatever you can send me, and I'll just copy and paste them in the in the description of this video. And uh, this will be up in probably about two weeks. I'll send you a, a link and a thumbnail that you can share if you would like to. Okay, cool, awesome, oh. dude. Great to talk to you today.
You as well. Last request. Send me a selfie I can use in the thumbnail, please. I'd appreciate it. Oh, sure. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, man. If you like this kind of content, go out and check out his music. All the links and everything will be there. If you like the videos, please show us some love. Give us the thumbs up, all that stuff. Let's subscribe to the channel. You know what it is, man. We love you guys. See you next time. Peace. Bro.